All right, good morning everyone and uh, thank you for coming for the California State Board of Food and Agriculture meeting. Today we have um, a great agenda focusing on the October wildfires, kind of an update on the situation and also some of the federal and local response that's occurring, as well as a discussion on water fix later this afternoon. Um, if everyone could please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. And we'll do roll. Rachel Arzamendi, Ashley Bourne, Don Bransford, Don Cameron, Nancy Cassidy, Here. Helene Dillard, Here. Ben Drake, Mike Gallo, Here. Crystal Haling, Eric Holst, Here. Bryce Lumberg, Here. Craig McNamara, Martha Montoya, Joyce Sterling, and Andy Fulin. Perfect. And we have a quorum. Thank you so much. Um, the meeting minutes for last month's meeting were distributed. Are there any questions, comments, motions? Move approval. Ben and Don. Cameron. All right. Any further discussion? All those in favor, say aye. aye. Opposed? And the minutes pass. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and Madam Secretary, uh, do you have an update for the board? Once again, I left my list upstairs. Um, since we're gonna be talking about wildfires, I won't um, go into that, but it is um, important, as tragic as the events were, um, to remember that we could make it a lot worse if people stopped going to the North Coast, and they have. There have been crickets in the restaurants and hotel cancellations and people in the, in the tasting rooms. And so Visit California is doing a really uh, great effort to um, remind people that there's still a lot left there. Um, the recovery road will be long, but you will hear um, how well people are working together. So we, we hold all of the victims of wildfires this year um, in our thoughts, and it is yet another time where, Joy, you're over here, where um, our fairgrounds were utilized in ways that are unbelievable and to watch this team all work together and see how they set up in the middle of night um, is pretty amazing. So I want to start by welcoming our new members, Rochelle and Andy. It's great to have you here at this meeting. Um, and it's an unusual one. Josh runs a very tight ship when he's sitting in for our chairman, Craig McNamara, who I know reached out to all of our new members um, and I've been in communication with him frequently, and he's got good internet access from the mountains of North Vietnam. So he's, he and his daughter seem to be um, having a fabulous experience there. Um, I uh, just wanted to mention a couple things. Secretary Sonny Perdue from USDA uh, was in our state Sunday and Monday. He had originally planned to visit California a couple of months ago, and his trip was canceled because of hurricanes. Um, so it was very nice that he squeezed this couple of days into his packed agenda. He was in Modesto on Sunday afternoon for a town hall meeting. We had about 300 people there. It was hosted by Farm Bureau and the Modesto um, Community College. And in addition to starring Secretary Perdue, um, on Friday, very late, um, the State Director for Farm Services Agency and the State Director for Rural Development were both named and both um, Kimberly Van, who is the new Rural Development Director, and um, Abre Betancourt, who is the new Farm Services Agency Director, were able to join us um, in Modesto. But I do have to say, with all due respect to Secretary Purdue, the star of Sunday afternoon was the new National FFA President, <laughs> Brianna Holbert, who is a graduate of Lodi Toke High School and is a, an ag education major at Chico State. And I asked if there was anything I could do to help her and she said, convince the administration at Chico State to accelerate my last few weeks of college because her obligation is a year travel around, here, around the world, literally. And so she's trying to accelerate the rest of her semester's classes. And I said, well, if I can help, I'm happy to do that. But 
it's terrific. We have not had a national officer from California, I believe, since 2007 or 2005. But she's, she's wonderful. And just to see all of the students in the audience and all the adults, you could tell who's ever been in FFA because they were right there doing selfies with Brianna. So that was great. Um, I just wanted to comment on a couple things. One is our Asian citrus psyllid and Wang Long Bing positive finds continue to add up. And the footprint of this program has expanded dramatically since the first of the year. Um, the committee is going through a very intense strategic planning with our interim director of the ACP program, Nick Condos. Um, it's, it continues to be a big problem, but all of our pest issues this year, it's been a long season. It seems like we never have enough chill hours to ever put a stop to any pest detections. We've got a number of medfly issues as well as other fruit fly issues going on, so it's been a, it's been a tough season for that. But, um, continue to worry a lot about our um, protecting our citrus industry and keeping the disease in residential areas. If we have to have it, let's keep it away from our commercial orchards. I do want to come in and thank Josh for a couple things. One is that we've continued to do a number of Climate Smart Agriculture Outreach events, and the webinars are surprisingly very, very popular. I think the last one you did was with the Netherlands. And that had over 200 and some odd people checking in to that. So it's been a great combination, these countries that we've done the MOUs with and that we've been able to travel to, to be able to continually do some updates that have relevance for our farming community here. And then Josh also has been organizing with DWR and others our groundwater conference tomorrow. We've got a great sign up for that. Uh, for all of you that are that are participating in some way, thank you for doing that. This is really a focus across our regulatory agencies to understand the opportunities, what the barriers are, and what we can do to help streamline um, the process. So we're glad that we've had early pioneers in this venture, Don, and that the Almond Board of California has brought in a bunch of other landowners this year, and that for of all the years we decided that there was going to be a pilot project. We did it in a year that there were actually peak flows to capture and study and see what's next. So I'm looking forward to tomorrow's discussion. Thank you. Perfect. Well, thank you, Madam Secretary. Um, do we have any questions for the Secretary? Nancy. Um, only what the press office puts out. And I saw the one that just came out this morning, actually right before I came downstairs, was the governor suggested that this might be a good time for California and the EU to connect their um, cap and trade programs and do the auctions. So we'll see how that goes. We, the, was it the last one or two ago that was the first ones we did with a Canadian province or two Canadian provinces? Two Canadian. Yeah, we now have. So... Um, exploring other opportunities um, to make that program work and expand it. And Joy? Um, what, do you, did you know previously or what was your impression of the, the person, the woman who was head of the rural development for USDA? Um, I, I think they'll, they'll both be great. They've got deep understanding of agriculture. Um, and Kimberly is from Northern California. She, was she a Calusa supervisor? Is she still a Calusa supervisor? She happens to be the chair, the co-chair of the site's JPA. Um, and um, she has a long record of, of service um, in, in Northern California. So, yeah. She worked for Doug Osi in the regional office uh, when he was in Congress, and uh, she's also worked for some area developers here in Sacramento, yeah. among other things. So um, she starts, she told me, um, because of commitment, she will not start until December 1st, I believe. Aubrey is scheduled to start her job on Monday. Is, is that it's a different classification of job than it was before reporting directly? directly to Secretary Purdue, so, a plus, uh, no, a minus? That, yeah, that's, um, 
Well, I have personal feelings about that based on my experience. Uh, but it is what it is. Um, it is the same classification. The state directors uh, reported directly to the undersecretary and the two, what were then two deputy undersecretaries of rural development. And in the new administration, the undersecretary and deputy secretary positions uh, are, are not there. There is a, uh, a special assistant to the secretary and the secretary's office that oversees all rural development programs. Um, so there is someone directly in the secretary's office um, that they report to. But rural development has a number of arms to it that are all run by um, career personnel as administrators. You know, there's complex utility programs and telecommunications programs and housing programs, and those all continue to have their administrators um, that have the most day-to-day -day interaction with the state directors. Yeah. Um, I thought it was notable that Secretary Purdue acknowledged the need for some sort of a guest worker program, and, uh, you know, so I think heard from California farmers that labor issues are a big deal and, and what we got going on right now is not working, so. I, there were two from the Modesto meeting, there were two repeated, and I mean repeated themes. One is the need for uh, agricultural workforce, um, but the biggest message was on trade. Um, there was a dairyman there who read a list of things that are issues for him but he doesn't lose sleep over and he went through everything from milk pricing to how he uses equip to a $10,000 check they got from the government the week before and his wife said, what's that for? And he goes, I think we have some base acres someplace. He goes, I don't know, I guess, I, I don't know. And Secretary Purdue said, I'll take that check back if you don't want it. He said, no, my wife wouldn't like that. But he said, the one thing that keeps me awake at night is if we do not have NAFTA because it means so much to our crop and so many others. And that was a very strong message that was repeated over and over and over. All right, thank you, Madam Secretary. Um, I think before we begin with the uh, formal program, I definitely want to say both to Rochelle and Andy, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be working with you, and congratulations on your appointment. And I think it would be really just kind of helpful just to do a quick kind of round robin and introduce yourself and kind of give some little background for you and the board as well. In one minute or less. Yes. Don't put faster on me. And please be sure to use your mic as well. Thank you. I assume you want to start. Yes. <laughs> Uh, hello, good morning. My name is Andy Thule, and I'm the Dean of the College of uh, Agriculture, Food, and Environmental Sciences at Cal Poly. Uh, been uh, four years ago, was named the interim dean, and then the real dean three years ago. So we've made quite a transformation in the college, and it's great to be here. Thank you so much. And I'm Eric Holst. I'm Associate Vice President for Working Lands at Environmental Defense Fund. I'm based here in Sacramento, and uh, been a part of this board for three or four years. My name is Joy Sterling, and I'm CEO and partner of my family's winery, Iron Horse Vineyards in Sonoma, and I'm on my second term. I'm Helene Dillard, and I'm Dean of the College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences at UC Davis, and I think I've been on the board three years. I'm Nancy Cassidy, 20 years the general manager of a local food co-op in uh, San Diego, Organic Vegetarian Store and uh, currently spending my time with the national organization working on the climate crisis. Karen Ross. Bryce Lundberg. I uh, work at my family's uh, rice farming operation in Richville, California. We specialize in organic rice and organic quinoa. Um, we produce a number of rice products in, as well. Um, I uh, serve on a Western Canal Water District Board and chair the Northern California Water Association uh, Board of Directors. Um, of this board, uh, I do serve as Water Committee Chair and liaison to the California Association of Food Banks. I'm very proud of the farmers uh, and um, food uh, producers in California who have responded to the uh, um, Redwood Empire Food Bank um, needs and hope that they continue to um, to follow your request, uh, Joy, in, in responding by making generous donations. 
I'm Ashley Boren. I'm the Executive Director of Sustainable Conservation. We're a nonprofit that works collaboratively with agriculture and other stakeholders to find ways to steward natural resources uh, in ways that make economic sense. And I've been on the board for a lot of years. I'm not actually <laughs> sure how many. So. <laughs> I'm Mike Gallo, uh, Joseph Gallo Farms, uh, dairy farmer, cheese maker, almond grower in Merced County. Uh, I'm on my second uh, term on the board. I'm John Bransford. I'm a farmer. I grow, uh, farm up the valley here in Coosa County. I grow rice, almonds, and prunes. I'm uh, president of Glen Coosa Irrigation District, which is the third largest irrigation district in the state. Um, and I am also on the site's JPA. Uh, excuse me. Oh, boy, that's bad. That is bad. <laughs> and I, I chair the UC uh, Ag and Natural Resources President's uh, Ag Advisory Committee. Oh, Very that's good. horrible. I'm in trouble. <laughs> Morning, uh, Don Cameron, General Manager for Terranova Ranch, uh, Fresno County. Farm about 25 different crops, organically, conventionally, uh, and also chair the Science Advisory Panel here in Sacramento. Okay. Let's see what they say. And he was Agriculturist of the Year. I said, wow. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, it's an honor to be here today. I understand I'm next to the two troublemakers, but just so you know, I'm on the side. Uh, my name is Rachel Arizmendi. I am the mayor of the city of Sierra Madre and also the vice president and chief operating officer of a community development organization in Southern California. Uh, but by way of background and education, I am a registered dietitian and I do have over 15 years in the National School Lunch Child Adult Care Food Program. Well, Rochelle and Andy, again, welcome, and we look forward to the discussions as we move forward. Um, now we'd like to move over to Dan Bout, who is the Assistant Director for Response at the Governor's Office of Emergency Services, um, either the podium or the table, whichever you prefer. And uh, Dan's going to give us kind of an update on the October wildfires that hit the wine country. All right, again, and my name is Dan Bout at Cal OES, where I run our Sea Operations Center. <clears throat> and our, our overall response uh, to this to these devastating wildfires. So I'll start with kind of the broad brush, uh, how they started, and some of the deliberate efforts, and then where we're at right now. So those, those firefighting uh, efforts started in October 8th, and they started with the Cherokee, the Lobo, the McCourtney, and the Laporte fires. <clears throat> so that was initially what we're looking at on that Saturday, or the early Sunday morning. On October 9th, then we had additional starts, Redwood, Sulphur, Pocket, Nuns, Patrick, and the Atlas fires all started. And what we're looking when we went into these fires was critically dry fuel beds. We were months past our rains, and a lot of the vegetation was still suffering the after effects of five years of drought. And so you add to that, uh, into these critically dry you know, fuel beds, uh, gusts that were coming up between 40 and 60 miles an hour, <clears throat> what we're seeing was fire activity that was occurring at night with the same ferocity that had occurred during the day and actually blew many of these fires from areas we tr traditionally see them, you know, the hillsides <clears throat> and areas where we're used to doing wildland firefighting right into neighborhoods with no slowing down whatsoever. And um, <clears throat> so on October 9th, about 1.30 in the morning, the State Operations Center was activated to support our emergency management coordination efforts statewide. And to coordinate those mutual aid requests that were coming in from Yuba, Sonoma, Napa, Lake, Mendocino, Butte, Nevada, and Solano counties, who were all being impacted by the fires I mentioned earlier. So we started that deliberate resource adjudication process. And across California, we had more than 11,000 firefighters engaged and 500 law enforcement personnel that were being activated through law enforcement mutual aid to, aff to affect those impacted communities to help with those evacuations and all the other wraparound services that come in this kind of a rapid environment. And we also had more than uh, 3,000 National Guardsmen that were called in to supplement those efforts. So suppression efforts across all those fires included 1,000 engines, 30 air tankers, 73 helicopters, with an, uh, with an additional 177 fire crews and engines coming in from the states of Oregon, Nevada, Washington, Idaho, Utah, New Mexico, Colorado, in Arizona, and we even pulled in some firefighting assets uh, from Australia with some uh, with some IMT 
uh, capabilities. So we were spreading the net as far and as wide as possible, get these assets in to mitigate these extraordinary fires. Uh, on October 27th, the Southern LNU complex, which was what what the uh, what was earlier the Atlas fire, that was in, that was impacting Sonoma, Solano, and Napa. We, so we finally got 100% containment on the 27th. On the 31st, so just on Halloween night, uh, the Central LNU complex, which was the Tubbs, Nuns, and Pocket fire, which were impacting Napa and Sonoma, that's when we got 100% containment on those. So those were burning through the month of October. The aftermath of those wildfires was 245,000 burned acres, 8,900 structures destroyed, and 43 deaths throughout California. So uh, Cal OES, during those efforts, we uh, essentially assisted the, our county, our local partners, with uh, finding places across 51 shelters for, for 4,505 evacuees scattered across those regions. And that was of a total evacuated population of around 100,000. And then uh, we distributed more than 40,000 meals, 60,000 liters of water, 2,088 compliant cots, those impacted communities, and 12,000 um, kits to include blankets, sheets, and other um, uh, equipment people would need when they move into a shelter with no notice. So on October 9th, uh, Governor Brown issued an emergency proclamation for those eight counties that we brought up uh, due to the effects of these multiple fires causing damage to the critical infrastructure to the homes and causing the evacuation of residents. And that allowed the all state agencies to start assisting Cal OES with pushing resources down to those local counties to mitigate those impacts. And we didn't wait for counties to come up with a laundry list of things they needed. We've been through enough disasters where across the state family we're leaning forward and getting assets to those counties, knowing what the anticipated needs would be. And so that, you know, when they start realizing we don't have X, it's already on their doorstep. Because again, in fires moving as dynamically as these, we've seen fires across the state of California. We know the kind of resource expectations and limitations that our local partners have. And so we are doing that deliberate effort across the state family to get that equipment and services out to the shelters, out to the areas where we needed them. So Governor Brown issued uh, an executive order on the 18th to, uh, to help cut red tape and expedite the recovery efforts in communities impacted by wildfires. On the 21st, he followed it up with an executive order to help remove household hazardous waste from those wildfire impacted neighborhoods. And then on the 28th, he issued uh, a proclamation declaring the 28th as a day of remembrance for the Northern California fires throughout the state of California. Now on October 10th, uh, FEMA announced that federal disaster assistance was being made available in response to the governor's request uh, to supplement state, tribal, and, uh, and other local recovery efforts in the areas impacted by the wildfires. So that takes us to where we're at now. So as of yesterday, um, our state and federal partners that are doing this deliberate cleaning up, DTSC, the Army Corps of Engineers, US EPA, are executing a two-phase and consolidated debris removal plan to remediate those neighborhoods that were burned to the ground. So phase one is a removal of household hazardous waste. And that's waste from houses that pose a threat to the public health, to animals, or the environment. So these are ignitable chemicals, toxic chemicals, corrosive chemicals, uh, or reactive chemicals. And these are literally sweeps. And again, this is uh, the governor recognizing the threat to many of these chemicals. They just sit around in most of our, uh, in most of our yards or garages um, to allow uh, these teams to sweep through and get rid of these dangers that are potentially off-gassing and impacting those communities. So like, you know, the pool chemicals, the, the antifreeze, car batteries, solvents. So <clears throat> they're moving deliberately through these areas and taking those things that are just immediately available. They're not digging through the rub rubble. They're finding the things that they can visually see and taking care of them to make sure they're mitigating those hazardous waste concerns in those burned areas. Uh, so in Sonoma County, uh, we have 194 staff and contractors working right now. And the number is continuing to go up as we go day by day. And of the 6,153 parcels that were burned, we've uh, taken household hazardous waste out of 3,887. In Napa County, we have 44 staff and contractors working. And of the 767 parcels, we've cleared 436. Um, we've completed all work on household hazardous waste in Nevada County, in Lake County, and in Yuba County. In Mendocino, we have 15 staff on scene and of the 337 parcels, we've cleared 172. And we're starting the Butte County clearance process uh, today. 
So now phase two. So that was phase one, getting rid of those household hazardous waste materials. Phase two is the removal of the rest of the debris uh, left behind by those blazes. And that includes everything that's burned on that site. And <clears throat> so um, that phase is beginning in multiple counties now. And we're pushing with our working, we're pushing our local partners to understand the importance of the ROEs, the right of entry forms. And so what predicates whether or not we can actually perform those clearance operations is the homeowner saying, you have the right of entry to, uh, to perform the cleanup of our site. And, and part of the reason we're, we're being very deliberate and working very closely with our local partners to expedite that is how long this, this debris clearance will take is predicated on how quickly we get those ROEs. Because we're not just going on people's properties unless they sign those. As you can imagine, when you have thousands of homes in the ground, the difficulty of taking a very large labor force and, and doing parcels in ad hoc fashion, that will stretch that time period. And again, our goal is by the, the beginning of 2018 to have all those pads ready to turn over to the community so they can start that rebuilding process and start getting back to that new normal. Um, and so I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that the one website that we have um, throughout the state family that, that kind of guides people who have questions about where do I go, you know, what do I do, what exactly does a ROE form do, because there's a lot of misinformation out there, is on uh, www.wildfirerecovery.org. So that site will walk um, any interested party with all the different steps. So if for some reason, let's say, they haven't had a chance to plug in with all the local assistance centers that are embedded in each of the counties, but they're like, okay, I, I don't even know where to start. That's the area that will tell them, okay, here is what's available if you need new license services, right? Because you've burned or you lost your license in, in your home. You'll go to this location and we can expedite the recovery of it. And here's the other um, uh, capabilities that are available to you and how you get access to them. So uh, that's our broad brush and where we're at right now with those recovery efforts. And I'll, I'm open to any of your questions. Well, can I just start by, um, it's in times like this that people actually appreciate what government does because there are people who spend their life like Dan, constantly thinking through what could happen and being as prepared as we possibly can be. And to have one that had this kind of immediate crisis, we went through the drill with Oroville, which was kind of slow unfolding, but the impact could have been tremendous. This was all of my staff that work because we're staffing the center 24-7, talked about Oroville at certain times of the day and night was just sitting there like trying to stay awake. This was constant activity for days upon days. OES does a fabulous job. It pulls everybody together. And in addition to OES, I have to tell you all, my new crush is on the National Guard because <laughs> you cannot believe the issues that would come up on our morning calls and it was like, this is going to take 30 days or this is going to take two weeks. <laughs> the general would say, well, we've got some people who could come in and help with that. It's just like, they've got everything. I mean, people work so hard in times like this to help local communities. And I just can't commend you enough for the work that you do. I would like to propose a standing ovation. <laughs> Well, and again, we couldn't do it with all the members of the state family and our local, I mean, <clears throat> it was, uh, you know, even with our, our partners from every state agency, I mean, we had people working 16, 17 hour shifts. Uh, we were 24 seven, but you know, we had state uh, employees. I actually had to actively go in the sock and say, I need you to go back because you know, we're two days into, and we're still activated working 16 hour shifts in the state operations center. And so again, you know, we have very well intentioned uh, you know, employees who want to see it through the end, but you're like, okay, this is a marathon and we're just starting it. So, I mean, that was the kind of commitment we were seeing from all our state agency partners. Joy? Well, first of all, let me add my voice to the chorus of thank yous. Um, living in Sonoma County um, and uh, you discover how important government is all the way down to your supervisor and your sheriff and you know so for everybody when election day rolls around do not worry about that it's not a presidential election all the way down in a crisis it really matters my um, 
Well, and also I want to say all over Sonoma County, and I assume also in Napa and Lake and Mendocino, everywhere, there are still signs up everywhere that say thank you. You know, everybody is so touched by the heroism and incredible acts of kindness um, that we saw. My question is, it seemed shockingly long, unlike past crises that they happen, and yes, there's a long hall to rebuild, but this went on forever. And um, so is that something that your office now is taking into account as part of our new, new normal? Well, I mean, I think um, what we've seen in general throughout disasters in California is they're increasing in magnitude. Uh, I mean, we're seeing the real impacts in the environment and they're reflected in like the ferocity of these fires. Um, and, uh, and this is, I mean, we are making these deliberate plans based on this new normal because, uh, you know, to do anything otherwise would be foolhardy. This is what we're seeing is that new pattern and we're really having to look at how do we shape our uh, public safety system in order to get, you know, requirements out to these locations even faster. And how do we look at, um, and I know all our local partners are also looking at this. So how do you deliberately, you know, shape your planning efforts in order to address the fact that we're in a far more uh, incendiary environment than we used to be. Just, I just wanted to ask a few more questions on that, but because unfortunately you're having to learn by the hard way. I mean, you know, these are catastrophic events that become even more catastrophic, catastrophic every time you have another one. But uh, I live in an area where there's a lot of men that have dozers and so they you know they spend their time going up on these fires and and you know the state has a tremendous amount of horsepower in terms of equipment and and um, I think the planning is very important but are you also looking at what can we do in the off season with all this equipment to try to minimize some of these catastrophic events. Now, when you have a 60 mile an hour wind, I don't know what you can do because it just it just blows things everywhere. But you know, there's a lot of maintenance that could be done uh, with some of that equipment because uh, because it just sits it sits for six or eight or nine months. But but I, I applaud you for what you're doing and and you know every time there's an event like this, you're faster. But, but you know, hopefully there's as much energy being spent on the prevention side. And, and that's, I mean, that really is the key because for every dollar you spend on that prevention, you're saving yourselves $100 in the response phase. So we can never get ahead of it by just building a larger and larger and faster and faster response apparatus. We really have to put the time in, just like you mentioned, beforehand and intelligently think through how do we use what we have in order to buy down that risk. So I think that's what a lot of communities will be going through over the next several months and years. Like, how do we look at, um, at weighing the risks and the costs? I think Ashley had a follow-up. I, I just want people to be aware that the, um, the LAO's office, the Legislative Analyst Office, has been conducting a study this fall about how to increase the level of fuel reduction and things in force, because there's a lot of permitting and regulatory review issues that are involved in that. And so how do you do that by protecting environmental standards, but still ensuring that more can be done to increase this kind of prevention. So they expect that report to come out either end of the year or early next year. Yeah. And Secretary Ross. Um, two things. One is I continue daily to get questions about on-farm debris removal because even though the vineyards oftentimes served as a fire break, the heat of the fire completely wiped out pumps, irrigation infrastructure, sheds, tractors, equipment, um, and, and we understand that the home sites are, are first, and in Napa County, FEMA has said if there are farm sites in conjunction with where there are home sites, then it's efficient for them to do that. But can the farmers go in and do their own removal? I, I'm expecting a paper any day, a, like a one-pager from OES, so maybe it's come in today and I haven't seen it, to just really summarize this up to to give some clear guidance to the farmers, because farmers in Sonoma County are hearing something slightly different than Napa County. Is, do you know if there's anything there? Because it's a lot of stuff. I don't know where it's all gonna go. No, no, absolutely. And, and I've seen guidance, you know, specific for the home sites about what that standard is for cleanup. Mm -hmm. 
I, I can't recall seeing something, so I'll bring that back to OES and we'll make sure we get something I right up because I mean that. that's a it's yeah. clearly a need. Yeah. I also uh, wanted folks to know that we're going to do a post event download with all of the fairgrounds that have been impacted this year because it's shown us while we have assets that can be moved around on this particular one when we the second relocation of the of the Sonoma Developmental Center all of those clients being moved into and trying to recreate hospital and health healthcare clinics really showed us a lot of vulnerabilities and so we can move our deferred maintenance projects up to making sure that we've got equipment where it's needed that it can be moved as quickly as possible and working with those fair managers of what we've learned from that to make sure that fairs continue to be an asset to the community in this situation. Right. And, and Secretary Ross, that's an outstanding uh, point to bring up. The critical roles, you know, our fairs have always been there. We've, they've always been part of our larger statewide responses because they're great staging areas. And in this case, we saw not just uh, the activation of six of those different fairgrounds, but some were being used in ways that we haven't. So uh, the Dixon Fairgrounds being used to house uh, the Sonoma Developmental Center. And essentially, you know, serving as a, um, uh, like a, a relatively uh, acute care facility for that population, which requires an enormous amount of wraparound services. So, you know, that was, uh, that was there and available in a circumstance in which we didn't have a lot of other options. And then we actually had fairs being used as both a staging ground for our fire crews and our incident management teams while they're also serving as shelters which was something we haven't had to do before but just because of the lack of adequate space and the magnitude of these evacuations you know we were really um, putting a strain on that system and it, and it came through with flying colors I know I know the rural communities would love a retainer for their fairgrounds for, uh, <laughs> for that opportunity uh, you know they are you know I, I, I hate to say it but they become accustomed to being fire staging centers, which pays some of their costs. So they, they are reimbursed. They're reimbursed. I have a question from Bryce Lumber. I had uh, maybe three, three items I was wondering if you comment on. Uh, the uh, impact um, to uh, people and, and property um, environment is, is significant. Uh, and the resources you brought in to address the issues are significant. I, I hadn't really heard any impact on first responders. Um, I hadn't heard of any any loss of life or injuries or uh, or issues related to first responders. H how did they fare during this significant event? Uh, so one of those 43 deaths was a contractor affiliated with the fire, with the wildland response, um, and they were killed in a tragic accident. Um, but, you know, there weren't any other casualties uh, within the first responder community related to this incident itself. Um, but, you know, like, like any community, um, you know, there, it, it's very difficult, you know, when, when these uh, crews go out for weeks at a time, you know, there's obviously impacts. Sure. And so, um, and, and this includes not just to the first responders in the field, but also to the people in the state operations centers or the emergency operations centers. And so we are making uh, programs available to them and making sure we get them the opportunity to plug into those kind of wraparound services, whether it be, you know, uh, the chance to unvent or talk about something that they're dealing with, um, with a crisis counselor or other services they might want to avail themselves outside the, the workplace. But we're making those opportunities available because that is uh, an issue where, you know, anyone can sprint for a week, but a month into this crisis, working these kind of hours, it, it's having a cumulative effect that we're being very careful to monitor. Fire uh, just seemed, um, I mean, just, uh, from, well, it's just the impact's dramatic. How does the um, fire, a recovery after a fire of this magnitude compare to uh, a hurricane or a, uh, another type of disaster um, where, the, where the infrastructure is affected differently? Um, uh, could you make any uh, comments relative to the kind of re rebuilding after a fire right. of this magnitude versus a, a other type of natural disaster. Right, so some degrees, there's a little bit of apples to oranges, but I mean, I think to your question, we've had major, uh, three major hurricanes throughout the United States. And and so, you know, how do those compare? In, in Texas, in Florida, and in Puerto Rico, you had a lot of damaged sites due to flooding, right? And how you deal with that is very different from how you'll deal with a wildland incident. So they had a, a higher number of damaged homes, 
where you have to strip out the drywall and you're concerned about mold, but that home, like you can strip it down to its studs and there's a high level of being able to rebuild it. When you look at actually destroyed homes, there were more destroyed homes in this incident than there were in those hurricanes, which means that you know we're starting from scratch. And not only that, but we have this massive debris operation um, that we have to, you know, we have to mitigate. And and what makes this difficult is <clears throat> so the type of um, the type of uh, emergency protective measures that we'll put into place in order to protect the watersheds and some of the environmental concerns in this area are are different from what you would do in an area where there's a hurricane because we're worried about like you know the the burn debris getting to sensitive sites and so there's a lot of um, and, and I didn't speak to this specifically but there's a lot of concurrent efforts that are occurring besides the household hazardous waste in our watersheds in order to like put in emergency protective measures in place. These are not permanent measures, right? These are waddles. These are techniques we have for ensuring that some of these uh, potential toxins aren't getting into, uh, the, in, into the water systems, right? And protecting our drinking water and some of the critical and threatened species in some of our watersheds. So. I have questions from uh, Joy Sterling and Eric Holtz. Well, first I wanted to make a, just a little plug for Sonoma County. Our local chefs and all of our farmers and cheesemakers and everybody contributed so fabulous. If you do have to be evacuated, do it in Sonoma County. Because <laughs> you just, oh, you eat extremely well. You eat extremely, extremely well. So that's number one. And then my uh, question was also following up on, on the preparations for what we hope will be rains. Right. So uh, in those efforts, so there was a, <clears throat> a wort, a wildland, uh, I'm gonna misremember the name, wildland environmental response team. And so uh, they're a mix of hydrologists, geologists, uh, soil scientists, foresters. And what they do is they go into these impacted areas. Uh, they went to Sonoma, they, well, each one of the fires, uh, Sonoma, Napa, Mendocino. And they came up with, here are the, the critical issues. Right, here's the things that need to be shored up immediately for emergency protective measures. Here's the things that need to be done over the long term, erosion control measures that need to be put into place. And, and so they came up with that prioritized list. So that team, um, and it's actually being coordinated with both Cal OES, Cal Fire, and, our, and uh, Sonoma County and the city of Santa Rosa. They, they, they have a, a unified coordination group meeting that occurs daily where they reassess, here's the sites we've had, are they the most critical sites? So our first kind of gate was the, uh, the rains that came through on Thursday. And fortunately, it was relatively small in scale. We have another storm that's beginning in Mendocino tomorrow. And so, um, and so now the effort is, okay, out of these, which is the most critical? Is it, and, and, and which one of these can we more appropriately address by prioritizing debris removal? And so for instance, you might have a, 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 some, a burned home that's right next to a watershed. And let's say it's 50 feet away, it's right on that edge. So the question becomes, is it more expeditious for the county to say, we want this taken care of first, let's get the right of entry and get all the debris off so it's not an issue? Or do we not have the time and do we need to get visqueen and wrap that site to ensure that we don't get the materials flowing into the watershed? So those are discussions that are happening at the tactical level every day, both the local and the state level. And, um, and we haven't yet had a request for resources that we haven't been able to push down to the locals. Eric and then Don. Yeah, my question was about uh, sort of shelters and the needs of shelters. And so it's, we have a big state, right? right? We don't know when the next crisis is going to happen. So how do, you, how do you confront sort of staging materials and rapid response regardless of where the, where the need is? And, and how much of that is, you know, sort of emergency equipment versus, um, you know, the, the need for, uh, you know, food, for food and water, Right. basic needs for the folks that are evacuated. So, uh, and I'll give you just an example because you know we get a little better at this every time. <clears throat> so in this case, you had multiple evacuations that are occurring in the middle of the night, right? And I mean, you put yourself in the place of many of these residents. They went to sleep, nine, 10 o'clock, everything was fine, and someone's banging on their door at one in the morning. And that was if, some, in some cases, if, you know, um, if, if, if they hadn't got the alert through other procedures, and they're grabbing their material and just heading out. Right, and uh, we had a host of people we ran into who were like, "Wow, I wish I had thought to take two cars because we all just jumped into one, and you know my other car is burned, and now it's it's difficult, right? We're all the whole family shuttling in this one vehicle, but they didn't have any time to to respond to this, and so 
we normally when we look at evacuations, the if we in this case we had 100,000 people who evacuated, <clears throat> oh. and not all 100,000 of those went to shelters, because what we find is most people will go to their neighbors, they'll go to their family's house. Most people have like a whether they've thought through it or because they have a very strong family or friend network, they have a place they go to. But we always plan on right as a as an adjunct, how do we set up shelters for that entire population? And so we work with the Red Cross and our local partners to pre-identify in every county, here's locations where we will stand up shelters and here's the services we have on site. Now, um, so when this disaster kicked off, we immediately, and this is like at you know, 2.30 in the morning, right? So before we even have people coming into the shelters in large numbers, how many shelters do we have here? We have 37, right? Well, that's not going to meet these needs. And some of those were met by community groups, by local organizations, by uh, faith-based communities standing up and saying, we're having, a, we're having a shelter here. Well, we know in those cases, there's probably not a lot of wraparound services. So we immediately ordered through uh, Department of General Services, uh, access and functional needs showers and bathrooms. And because we know that's gonna be a need. So no one's asked for anything yet, we're just staging it up because we know that's gonna be one of those critical shortages. And sure enough it was, because we took every access function need toilet and, shell, and uh, uh, restroom, or sorry, restroom and shower, uh, east, or sorry, west of the Mississippi. So we were literally pulling that morning from the entire nation because so many of those have been drawn to Texas and Florida. Um, and, and at the same time, we set up our state staging area. So we set up a staging area with enough uh, food and shelter for 50,000 people for 10 days. So we staged that before anyone asked for anything and we had the offloaders and everything ready. So that morning we had the tractor trailers set up and as soon as the communities were like, you know what, because you know, it takes them time too. A lot of people are working in parallel, but as soon as that emergency manager gets a chance to go and say, oh, we don't have any cots. You know, that night, um, many of the shelters had, had no cots whatsoever. And the National Guard was taking cots out of these um, out of the state staging area that we'd ordered and bringing them there so that first night, right, only hours after this started, people actually had a place to, to sleep because, you know, people will show up and they have certain expectations. I mean, at first, they're just happy they're out of the fire zone, right? And they're kind of in shock and they get a bottle of water and they sit down. But you're sitting down a lot of times in a gym floor or in an open setting, right? And, and, and we have to be um, very expeditious with how we give people some sense of normalcy, right? It's just a place to sleep. I mean, it sounds very simple but that can make all the difference and so what we do is we front load that uh, we look at what we think is available and then we essentially um, go for usually double that amount and then start pushing it into a staging area close to where it's needed so we reduce the time from when they ask for it to when we provide it yeah i'd, I'd just like to compliment you on your work um, you know you're you're preparing for disasters that you don't know I, I always expected California was going to have the big earthquake and we're going to lose half of San Francisco or something, but, uh, you know, we're... <laughs> okay. Some other city. <laughs> but, but really, I mean, you're, you're preparing for an, for an emergency that you really don't know what you're going to get. You're, you know, we've talked about flooding. We've talked about, um, you know, like you say, traditional earthquakes that uh, California is known for. But, you know, but wildfires like this, was this the probably the most impactful one we've had um, as far as loss of life and, and housing within the state? Right, when you look at the complexes, so the overall fires, if you look at that as a, as a group, it's collectively uh, the most damaging as far as costs. Uh, we're in the billions of, of, of losses, highest in structures lost and highest in lives lost. I mean, we, we see a, you know, we always want to interface between, you know, the city and the, and the woodlands because that's a nice place to live, but, uh, it's actually like a wick that'll bring a fire right into a community uh, that we haven't seen before. So it's great to see uh, actionable, functional government and uh, really makes me uh, glad to, to know you guys are there. So thanks. And our last question from Michelle. So again, commend you and all the coordinating agencies for a job well done. Um, I'm just curious because I came from the 211 world and right. that was a lot of the coordination of the communication out to, to folks. And by the way, you picked up one of our superstars, Sarah Finnegan. Don't know if you know her, but she's great. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I'm just curious as to what did you find is the most effective way to reach out to the communities and people, especially without electricity? And, and how do you see uh, improving that for future events and, and tragedies like this? 
So um, in California, so those, those outreach activities, right, how the community is alerted to local threats, that is something that's left in the hands of our counties. So essentially it's a local responsibility and we provide them with a host of assets. So, <clears throat> so one asset that's traditionally uh, used is what's called WIA, wirelessly, Wireless Emergency Alerts. So that is a FEMA program that um, Cal OES coordinates for the state of California. When I say coordinates, a local community will say, let's say a local county sheriff will say, we want to do these WIA updates, or sorry, WIA alert messages to our populations. So they will fill out the, the form and Cal OES will sponsor them, right? And, and then we'll pass that, uh, that request up to, to FEMA. FEMA will then adjudicate it and if they have the jurisdictional capability, we haven't had anyone say no, because again, you know, if you're asking for it, you have the jurisdictional authorities, then they get a certificate that says we're allowed to set out WIA messages. So WIA messages are, you essentially draw a polygon using a, the software and say, I want this message and you type it out right, sent to this area, and I want it to last for this long. So if someone drives in the area, I want them to get it on their cell phones for this amount of time. Now, um, not every community in California has, has wanted to, uh, you know, apply for the WIA process, right, because there are other alternatives. Some communities, um, I was driving in, you know, to uh, uh, Sacramento, and they had, a, you know, one of those signs saying, hey, sacalerts.com, right, and so those are what's called opt-in systems. So communities will frequently choose these because they're, they're relatively low in cost, and they rely on people opting in, right? So they'll say, hey, here's my text number, here's this, and then <clears throat> they'll receive that message. So some communities will choose that because it's a very low cost option. Some communities will also have reverse 911. So they will, you know, uh, buy software that will allow them to reach back to all the landlines and registered cell lines and call them and tell them, hey, you know, we're having XYZ incident. So, <clears throat> It's kind of a, a marketplace because each one has strengths and weaknesses. So um, I know some, I, there's some miscommunication sometimes at the local level about WIA because in its early days it had very broad um, uh, coverage. So you'd say, I want, to, I want to let this neighborhood know and because of the way our cell phone networks are set up, it would get to a much wider population. So I think there was initially some reluctance and there might still be some misunderstanding on how that system is propagated. But then other communities simply are, are thinking it might be more cost effective given the threats they face to use these other techniques. So uh, when communities, we have a, a state warning plan in which we outline all the different capabilities that these, the pluses and minuses of each one, and, um, and we make it available to all our local partners. And, uh, and then we also walk them through the process if they do want to apply you know, for the WIA service. But that, there isn't a mandate, like you must use X system. That really is something that we um, provide to all our different locals like here's the, you know, here's our recommendations and here's some pluses and minuses. Um, and so, but I, I don't think there's a perfect answer there right now. Um, and I, I left out the second step to the WIA process. The first part is getting that certificate at the local level. The next one is actually buying the software to, to use that. And, uh, and so there, there is a cost factor. You have to, you know, so I, I actually, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but I, that, that might be uh, a hindrance because again, um, I think there's a host of providers that provide that, but I don't know what the price point is for using that system. Well, Dan, thank you so much. I mean, I think that all of us take so much for granted in cases of emergencies, and just for you to kind of outline what is really happening kind of behind the scenes is just eye-opening. It's amazing. And thank you so much for all your work. Yes. Yes. For sure. So thank you so much. Um, I know uh, Bryce has a matter of personal interest that he wants to ask Joy before we bring up the next um, panel. Well, Joy, I had heard, you know, the, the impacts of the fire have, have impacted the, um, the grapes for 2017, that, that there's different kinds of damage, that the ash is one kind of damage, and just the, the amount of t time that the grapes have been in smoke um, is a different type of impact. Um, how, how are your uh, grapes and just in general the impact to the grape community. Well, thank thank you so much for for your concern. Um, and we were uh, lucky on so many fronts. Number one, we were west of everything, so no direct impact from the fires except for um, air quality. And the Sonoma look was to wear the masks. I mean, it was it was very eerie to go shopping in the grocery store and everybody's got a mask on and uh, and the air quality they say was worse than 
Beijing. But again, we were west of, uh, of all of the damage. So uh, even now, you, you, uh, today coming here, I went by the old Stornetta uh, site. And uh, so, you know, it, so it's sad for me to f finally see some of the damage. In terms of uh, the grapes, it's very, all of our fruit was in. So everything was in the cellar. So again, th there is no doubt that this was, from our perspective, a but for the grace of God experience um, because it was so incredibly random. 80% of the fruit of Sonoma County was already in. Um, and the um, fruit that was out there was primarily Cabernet, which um, the viticulturalists say has a thicker skin and so theoretically is uh, able to withstand smoke taint uh, better. Um, as Secretary Ross said, vineyards uh, are a natural fire break, um, except when it gets so hot that nothing can stand in the way. And uh, we don't know yet whether some of those um, very helpful vineyards, um, there are those who say they could uh, be, they, they're alive, but maybe they won't produce next year or maybe even two years, which is unthinkably horrible. Um, so that's, that's one aspect to be concerned about. Um, in terms of smoke taint, um, shoot, I don't know. There were, um, but al already um, the, um, there were a number of growers who um, their contracts were not honored. The wineries refused the fruit. Well, I guess I shouldn't say the contracts weren't honored because I presume there's something in the contracts that says. But nonetheless, you know, you, when you read about a grower who's been providing fruit to a particular winery for 30 years and that winery says no, you just say, what? <laughs> That's just not right. Um, and that was for wineries of, of uh, all levels of means. So, um, so there's, th there's a lot that we just don't know yet. And, and Bryce, yeah, so it's a great research opportunity, certainly uh, vitaminology, uh, but a lot of the wineries, this is the most expensive fruit of the year. That's what makes that, it was the last bit of it, but it's also some of the most expensive grapes. Um, and so almost all of the wineries were doing testing just to be super cautious, but on smoke taint, the grapes can be fine, but then it'll show up in the fermentation process or in the bottle. Um, but I think it's going to be a very manageable thing. There'll probably be a lot of blending in some of those cases, um, but everybody's going to handle it differently. Unfortunately, there have been isolated examples of the lawyers are already exchanging letters, and all I can counsel is let's be kind to one another. Well, Joy, thank you for that update. Um, I'd like to invite our next panel that's going to really talk uh, more about kind of the federal and state assistance that's available. We have uh, Jackie Johnson from the USDA Farm Service Agency, Jim Spear from the NRCS, USDA Natural Resource Conservation Service, uh, Cynthia Cowell from the U.S. Small Business Administration, Michelle Sutton Riggs from EDD, our Employment Development Department, and also Diane Ferrari. So if you could please join us at the table here. Um, I think, you know, right after this event, um, I had an opportunity to attend a meeting, and I think it was the director of water resources, who was really, who was also, I think, our local supervisor at the mm -hmm. time, had talked about really the impact. And it's not only that people are losing their houses, they're losing their job. And I mean, just like Dan was talking, the impact of this is just so severe in terms of just the planning and magnitude that goes on. So uh, we look forward to kind of hearing from you guys in terms of perspective, in terms of what assistance is really out there, not only for the farmers and ranchers, but also for the individuals working in those communities. So uh, Jackie, I think we'll start with you. If you can use the mic there. Ms. Preston, it's your turn green. Okay, now it's flashing green. All righty, well, I thought I'd just briefly tell you what um, Farm Service Agency did in 2017. And financially, we, we put over $300 million into the, the pockets of farmers in California. We made $188 million in direct payments, 13,300 direct payments to farmers, and we made over 1,000 loans for $120 million. And in 2017, 
there were um, disasters that needed to be addressed as well. We had the flooding, um, massive flooding in farmland it happened in Northern California and over on the coast. We instituted an emergency conservation program. We're still working on that right now, um, paying the benefits to those affected farmers. Thank you. And, you know, we, we, we exhausted our emergency funds for 2017 and now for fiscal year 2018, we are in line pending more emergency funds for emergency conservation. One of the things that was talked about was debris removal on farmland. And that's one of the things that we do. And the amount is TBD because we don't know how much money we're going to get. We get $10 million, $5 million, it's going to depend. But everyone who's, who's, who was affected and applies, um, if they meet the, uh, the, the producer eligibility standards, then they will get a payment. We're not gonna rank anybody. We're not gonna have some farmers get paid and some not get paid. Everybody will receive a payment, but the, the amount per linear foot of fence, per acre of debris removal, that is still to be determined. We'll also, part of the debris removal, you know, take away those old pumps and, and tanks, and we'll replace drip systems, we'll replace um, pumps that burned up, and um, everybody, every eligible producer who applies will get a benefit. Also, one of the things the Farm Service Agency has been doing in the, the last couple of weeks is we have sent volunteers to Puerto Rico. Um, we sent two volunteers. They got back Sunday night. They spent three and a half weeks in Puerto Rico. And um, my third volunteer left last week, and the fourth volunteer left or uh, is leaving flying to Puerto Rico today. And what had happened is once they got to Puerto Rico, they became rock stars because California, there's one thing we do have experience in, it's a variety of crops. And we become an expert on a new crop, you know, you give us something new, kumquat, rutabaga, become an expert immediately, figure it out, roll forward. <laughs> and so within 48 hours, the, the California team became the experts, became the goatee people, they've organized everything. They had hundreds of farmers just waiting in line for them every day. And um, they were originally there for two weeks. National office requested that we extend their stay for three weeks and um, they've done an outstanding job. Um, we opted not to help Texas and, and uh, the, the, we have our own disasters. We'll send people to Puerto Rico. They have a need for fluent Spanish speaking um, um, farm assistance, but I did decline to send anybody to Texas. <laughs> um, for, for our fire affected farmers, we have events planned next week on the 14th and 15th. On the 14th in Napa County and Sonoma County, we're having a public meeting and group sign up and in the 15th in Mendocino County, um, state office personnel and personnel from the other parts of the state of California will be there to assist also. So like I said, we're gonna get every, get the ball rolling, get everyone started. We'll take applications from everybody. Um, farmers will eventually have to, you know, make an appointment, come into the office, identify their land on our aerial photography, give everybody their social security number and personal information. But once we start the application, we get them in the system and we can track it. So that, that's gonna start in earnest next week. Jackie, is that gonna be like USDA one-stop shop or is it just gonna be FSA? It's just FSA. Just FSA. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, Jim? Good morning. If you could use the mic, please. Sorry. Sorry. Is Carlos still in Puerto Rico? Yes. Carlos is. Well, we're, we're, we're certainly hopeful. <laughs> but uh, we know it's going to be a fairly long term uh, effort over there for the benefit of the board. Uh, our state conservationist, Carlos Suarez, is uh, leading the USDA recovery effort in Puerto Rico. That, that is his home. He's familiar with it, very passionate about uh, uh, the recovery efforts there. And, and I know he's uh, representing us very, very well and, and contributing greatly uh, to that effort. So yes, we certainly hope he uh, returns. So again, it's a pleasure to be here and, and uh, to provide an update on what uh, the Natural Resources Conservation Service is doing in response to the fire situation here in, in California in the North State. 
um, kind of give an overview generally, and then we'll drill down a little bit in terms of some of the programs uh, that we're making available uh, to those affected. So we're, we're definitely engaged uh, in post-fire you know, ac activities. Um, a lot of response uh, to individual requests from uh, landowners who are affected. We're engaged with partners locally as well, uh, attempting to facilitate uh, uh, as much efficiency in, in this and, and kind of that one-stop shop uh, approach and, and do what we can to support the, the victims and those affected by the fire. Uh, engaging with FEMA, uh, I'll get into it a little bit later in terms of some of our programs and how, how they uh, 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 network with FEMA, but we've definitely been engaged with uh, FEMA leadership and talking to them and making sure, again, our messaging and communication information is uh, going out consistently. I've uh, been engaged with the local assistance centers that are set up in many of the affected counties, so we're, we're there present. We're also providing information, uh, making available to landowners in terms of conservation and, and our mission and the things that uh, we're advising, recommending that they can uh, proceed with immediately in, in terms of post-fire uh, rehab and, and recovery efforts. Public Affairs has been very active in terms of uh, getting information out, updating our fact sheets, again, making sure that the information uh, is available through our websites, through uh, other uh, local venues, just ensuring that uh, we give practical, immediate advice for affected landowners. We uh, have been uh, getting out information nationally through uh, news releases and, and, again, directing folks in terms of where they can get assistance. Uh, on the ground here, we've uh, also been sponsoring workshops, uh, principally with partners, to ensure that uh, our programs are well understood, how they can access them, how they can get the information, how they can understand our application process. So uh, uh, workshops are occurring in all the affected counties. We do have uh, strike teams. Uh, these would be interdisciplinary teams that we're sending out to assess and, and benefit, you know, principally relying on some of these watershed assessments that are going on and evaluating those documents and, and helping us to target where we think uh, our uh, limited resources can be best applied and, and looking at kind of those, those uh, higher risk areas and, and determining applicability to our programs and where some of our programs might uh, be able to uh, complement what, what other agencies or entities are uh, making available. We're also uh, engaged with the Sacramento Watershed Clearinghouse set up by FEMA, so we've got staff there and uh, attending and uh, present and involved in some of the discussions and meetings in terms of assistance being offered. And we've also assigned one full-time NRCS specialist uh, to staff at the uh, Joint Field Operations Center with uh, FEMA, and so that's an interagency effort. And again, we're wanting to be as engaged as we need to be to ensure that uh, we're coordinating with uh, the, the myriad of other state, local, federal entities that are also making uh, assistance available. And as uh, the need arises, we're detailing staff. So um, as you might imagine, uh, places like Sonoma County, Napa County, uh, Mendocino County, where we've had uh, pretty severe impacts from the fire. Uh, already getting overwhelmed with a lot of uh, requests for assistance to come out and meet individually with landowners who are affected. So we're now detailing staff from around California to come in and, and uh, help with that uh, effort and certainly help to re uh, improve the response time. Uh, many of our local offices uh, are understaffed, and so we're hopeful this is an effort that's going to, uh, again, uh, improve our customer service and, and improve our response time to get out as soon as possible and give recommendations, advice in terms of how landowners can ad address some of the effects of the fire. So programmatically, uh, we've got two principal programs that we can offer to landowners as well as uh, municipalities that are out as we are, assessing uh, impacts on their own lands, on infrastructure. The first one is the Environmental Watershed Protection Program. That uh, program is principally focused on uh, imminent threats to life and property. 
And so, again, we rely heavily on uh, our teams and then efforts uh, through the state of California that they're out looking at watershed assessments in a, in a regional, you know, more, more watershed perspective and trying to uh, understand where the greatest threats and risks are to life and property. And that program does require a sponsor. That sponsor is typically a, a local government entity such as the county or, or the city. And uh, the sponsor bears some responsibilities in terms of helping us deliver that program. Um, there's a cost share component to it. There's uh, their, their uh, agreement to kind of handle most of the local permitting issues for us. But that is uh, a program that uh, probably provides the most immediate uh, offer of assistance and, and protection for uh, life and property that might be in jeopardy as a result of the fire. We've got three projects going on right now, two down in uh, Southern California and then one in Lake County through the, environment, or the uh, Emergency Watershed Protection Program and, and we're pulling that documentation together and, and hope soon to be submitting that for funding consideration to our national office. Uh, again, throughout uh, the other counties, uh, similar efforts are ongoing in terms of assessing projects for eligibility for the uh, Emergency Watershed Protection Program. Strike teams are out uh, as we speak, uh, evaluating, assessing uh, potential projects. So um, that, that program is fully engaged and, and we're clearly uh, working with uh, partners locally to assess the eligibility and, and applicability of that program. The broader program that maybe some of you are familiar with, the Environmental Quality Incentive Program, is uh, also one that we can offer. And we've already received uh, an additional $4 million from our national office in response to the fire that we can target and direct to the affected counties. The, uh, we do have a, a catastrophic wildfire uh, fund pool, if you will, in terms of uh, focusing the applications and assistance to address impacts uh, post-fire. The uh, first application period was actually yesterday, and uh, we'll have a second one in, in December, but that's gonna allow us again to uh, really focus and target our assistance here uh, as we roll into fiscal year 2018 and, and uh, ensure that the priorities are, are appropriate and, and being directed to where they need to be. Uh, the types of practices we can offer under uh, the Environmental Quality Incentive Program uh, range from mulching, straw wattles, debris basins, critical area plantings, and uh, uh, in a longer term sense, we can get into some of the reforestation and, and uh, reestablishment of, of uh, trees and, and more permanent vegetation. We uh, have been able to uh, facilitate uh, some waiver processes that allow applicants to proceed and actually install practices in advance of any financial assistance contracts. So uh, the national office was very supportive of that in accommodating that request. And again, it allows landowners to actually move out well ahead of uh, any uh, financial contract that we can probably put in place in that time. So with that, I'll conclude my Perfect. report. Well, Jim, thank you so much. Um, Cynthia? It'd be great to kind of hear a perspective from the Small Business Administration because it's very different from kind of what we're used to from the farm side. Yes, my name is Cynthia Cowell. I am a public information officer for the Small Business Administration Office of Disaster Assistance. And we help uh, fund recovery by way of low interest government loans. We can lend up to $2 million to a business that uh, had physical damage, but even to businesses that suffered economic damage, even if they didn't suffer physical damage, they would be eligible for economic injury. Now these are non-farm businesses, but uh, we can also help uh, small agricultural cooperatives. And uh, so maybe some of these wineries that are hurting because of the harvest it doesn't sound like the harvest was as impacted as I thought it was, though. <laughs> For homeowners, we can lend up to two, up to two hundred thousand uh, dollars for physical repairs to a home or replacement. For homeowners and renters, we can lend up to forty thousand dollars to replace personal property, including cars. 
Now these funds are for uninsured recoveries. Uh, if, if you have insurance, but it's not enough, we can help with that. If a borrower has a high deductible and just doesn't feel that they can handle that, we can help with that. Um, we can also help aquacultural concerns um, with economic injury. And I don't know how much there is in the area, but there could be. Um, now, we have been beset by lots of disasters this year. We have currently 358 customer service representatives and public information officers in Texas. And when I heard about the fires, I called my boss and I said, I'll go home. And so I'm here. <laughs> We have several others that are in the field as well. And we are primarily helping with physical damage and economic injury in Butte, Lake, Mendocino, Napa, Nevada, Orange, Sonoma, and Yuba counties. And then all contiguous counties to these are also eligible for economic injury disaster loans. And that would be Calusa, Glen, Humboldt, Los Angeles, Marin, Placer, Plumas, Riverside, San Bernardino, San Diego, Sierra, Solano, Sutter, Tehama, Trinity and Yolo, and Washoe County, Nevada. Because we are so interconnected now as far as business goes that my business in Sonoma County may be referring people or, or supplying people in a contiguous county such as, um, I guess, Marin. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and uh, so we do, we do help those around us. We also we we have opened our surge centers. We normally have just four centers. We have two field operations centers: one in the east, one in the west. We also have a customer service center in Buffalo, New York, and our processing and disbursement facility in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, we now have processing capability in all four of those locations, and we have customer service phone banks in each of them. So a lot of people are worried that they're not going to get help in California because of everybody else that has things going on. And we've already approved over $20 million in low-interest low disaster loans just for this disaster, just for the fires. Now, the rates on these loans for homeowners and renters can be as low as 1.75%. And for businesses, it's just a little over 3.3%, 3.305%. <laughs> To be exact, for nonprofit organizations, the rate is 2.5 percent. And so, uh, when when an applicant initially applies for a loan and we go ahead and process it, then we will assign an interest rate. It will either it will be the market rate, which is competitive with local banks, or it'll be the low rate. The market rate for homes is 3.5 percent. So that's still pretty good. For businesses, it's 6%, and it's still 2.5% for nonprofits. We work exactly the opposite of banks. If you have a lot of money and you can fund your own repairs a little easier and you can handle a higher payment, then we offer you the high rate. And then if, you, if, if it's difficult for you to make the payments on, on, a low, on a higher rate, we offer you the low rate. So uh, if there's any questions... I think we'll hold questions to the end, but I had kind of kind of a specific area if you could address. Since the wine country is definitely tourism, I mean, that involves tons of restaurants and other and kind of um, establishments. How have you had areas, other areas that SBA has addressed in terms of economic injury that have been primarily like tourist destinations, and what has been that assistance that's been provided? And is there a specific time frames that, that um, those establishments need to apply? Yes, we do have, we do offer the low interest economic injury disaster loans to those 
tourism-based industries. Um, as long as it's not agricultural, unfortunately, we can't help agricultural. We refer them to FSA and USDA for help with that. Um, now, the deadline to apply for a disaster loan for physical damage is December 11th. So that's coming up. It's really important that people go ahead and get their applications in. And then for economic injury, it's not until July 12th of next year because nobody knows what's going to happen in the next six months. And uh, we, we still recommend, though, that everybody get your application in as soon as possible. I know a lot of people will say, I don't want a loan. I have insurance. And, you know, it's probably going to cover just about everything. And whatever it doesn't cover, then I'll just put it on a credit card. Well, 1.75% for a homeowner is quite different than your 20% or whatever you have on your credit card. And a lot of people won't have their insurance completely settled until after the December 11th deadline. So it's urgent that people go ahead and submit their application, even if they don't want a loan. If they decide that uh, they really don't want a loan, then uh, they don't have to take it. But the money's there if they need it. And there is a five-month deferment period after you sign your note. So you don't need to take it right away. You can make a decision as to what you want to do. Okay. Fine. Thank you. Perfect. Well, thank you, Cynthia. And then uh, Michelle or Diane? Okay. Hey, good morning. My name is Michelle Sutton Riggs. I'm from the Employment Development Department. Um, I'm an executive in the Unemployment Insurance Program. So I'm going to speak to you primarily about those benefits that are available to workers as well as um, the Federal Disaster Unemployment Assistance Program that became available due to these disasters. Um, the Employment Development Department, we do work closely with the Cal OES, and we do deploy staff to the local assistance centers. Um, and we've had staff since day one, pretty much, of the assistance centers there to offer not only unemployment insurance benefit services, but um, services from our employment services program, and Diane can speak to those programs. Um, as well as we've had tax representatives to offer um, extensions for, excuse me, I've been fighting a cold, um, <clears throat> deadlines for, you know, doing your tax reporting and whatnot. So we do um, make sure that we pr make all of those services available. Um, we also administer the state disability insurance program, and so if there are in individuals who are injured or the paid family leave program, if they're taking care of an injured family member, um, you know, we make those applications and information available as well. So um, our centers typically, in, in addition to having staff at these local assistance centers, um, most workers, almost all types of workers in California are covered for the state's regular unemployment insurance program, and that includes um, agricultural workers, okay? So um, the governor declared the disasters, the president declared the disasters in eight counties, which then allowed FEMA to do their assessment, and they made the what they call the Federal Disaster Unemployment Assistance Program available. And um, EDD does administer that program when um, it is offered on behalf of the federal government. Uh, but the way it works is that type of claim for um, the, they call it the DUA, is um, a claim of last resort, so to speak, for workers who um, we first check to see if they qualify for a state's regular UI benefit program. And so everyone who's unemployed as a direct result of the disasters, they need to apply as soon as they can. Um, they can do that, and we really encourage them to do it online. That's the fastest way to get their claims processed by us. And we, we encourage everyone to apply. Um, there's plenty of information on our website about eligibility criteria, but we don't want people to self-screen themselves out. We always encourage people just apply. We will determine what you will qualify for, okay? 
So the, the Federal Disaster Unemployment Assistance Program, what's different about that um, compared to the state's UI program is that self-employed individuals who are impacted and um, out of business because of the disasters can actually apply for this type of unemployment assistance, whereas they normally don't qualify under the regular state's program. So we've done a lot to get the word out, um, not only disseminating the information at the local assistance centers, but as well as we've um, published a news release. We've got a wealth of information on our EDD website. I can leave some information with you about uh, the Disaster Unemployment Assistance Program. I, I brought a stack of materials if you'd like me to leave those with you today. Um, but we do encourage, um, and we're trying to get the word out, especially for the self-employed, because they don't typically think of unemployment insurance. But the way to apply for the federal program is everyone needs to just apply using our regular state application, which can be online. Um, we have toll-free telephone numbers, and we also have a paper application that if they, they can't do it through those other means, they can mail in or fax to us and let us determine what they qualify for. The, there are timelines for applying for the federal um, unemployment assistance, and the cutoff date is coming up. It's November 16th, okay? So it is important that they apply. Now, they can apply after that date. We'll still take the applications. We will just have to look at what was the reason for not filing the claim timely, and we'll take um, good cause factors into consideration. But we are encouraging everyone to get their claims in by that. Um, it's a FEMA deadline. It's a, regu a federal regulation that dictates these, these timelines. Um, we filed the claims retroactively to October 15th, which was a week after the fires first started. Um, the benefit program under this, this federal program um, is a maximum of 26 weeks of benefits, and it goes through April 14th of 2018. Um, the benefit amounts depend on um, what they earn during a certain four-quarter period and on which we file their claim. And so we'll also determine what their weekly benefits amounts can be. Um, the minimum uh, until... Typically, we ask for some wage documentation, especially from self-employed individuals, but we will file their claim using what um, they call the average weekly benefit amount, which is $161. But the range can be as low as $40 a week up to a maximum of $450 for a total of um, 26 weeks. Okay. Um, let's see. We do work closely with um, our sister program, the Employment Services, and um, so I guess at this point, I'll turn it over to Diane. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Diane Ferrari, and I'm the executive for the Workforce Services. Um, the area that I primarily cover is almost all of Northern California, so from Merced all the way up to the Oregon border, including the San Francisco area. What we do in the Workforce Services Division is we actually administer the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. And these programs are, are to prepare adults, youth, and dislocated workers for participation in the workforce. We connect employers with um, individuals looking for work, and we also help the job seeker who is looking for employment. We also prepare up-to-date statistical information, demographics, an analysis of the state's business climate. So our labor market division has been very instrumental in actually mapping the whole fire area. We also have a listing of employers who are within that geographic area so that we can take a look to see who the employers are that may be impacted. Um, all of that information is confidential. We do not share it with the media. We do not share it with any other private or public um, groups or agencies. But one of the things that we're working on right now, um, actually as of yesterday, is really looking at a significant map of all of those employers who are in that zip code area, comparing it with individuals who have filed for unemployment insurance benefits to see specifically the names of those employers who are, who are letting their employees go at the current time. And then what we'll be doing is reaching out to them individually to find out what do you need? What specifically can we do to assist you either through um, more assistance with unemployment insurance or more assistance with um, work, 
uh, redirecting your employees either temporarily or permanently, uh, and maybe even doing um, some other connections with these other agencies that are, are available um, to help out. We have been in the um, local assistance centers, pretty much like OES, around the clock. Um, we have met individuals who come in to tell us exactly what has happened to their businesses. We've talked to individuals who tell us what have happened to their local homes and families, um, and basically been on site in all of the local assistance centers since they started, since OES started them. One of the things that um, you may not be aware of is in our local areas, we have um, America's Job Centers of California, we call them AJCCs. We're there all the time. We have these centers that are throughout the community. We have a couple of centers in Santa Rosa. We have one in Vallejo. We have one in Napa. We have one in Mendocino, Ukiah. So we are throughout California. We have more than 200 AJCCs throughout California. So we are there to help employers. We're there to help the job seeker. We're, help, we're there to help the unemployed individual um, with their unemployment insurance. So these centers are there all of the time compared to the local assistance center that is set up by the Office of Emergency Service, and it does close at some point in time. But for those individuals and for those employers who are still seeking assistance after the disaster center may close, they can go into their local state, um, uh, uh, America's Job Center of California. That's the name that's given, and it's used across the nation, because it is a nationwide network of centers to, to aid the um, unemployed some of our America's Job Centers of California are designated as significant offices. And basically what that means is we have dedicated offices that operate the Migrant and Seasonal Farm Worker Project. This program provides services to the agricultural community. The program specifically targets agricultural employers and workers that are classified as migrant, seasonal, or migrant food processing workers as defined by the federal law. Through the MSFW Outreach Program, EDD provides a full range of employment services to farm workers who otherwise would not have access to services through the normal intake process within the America's Job Center of California. In other words, we go out to the fields. We have representatives who go out to the fields and talk to the employers and also talk to contractors and talk to the farm workers. So that's available. Um, we help them with job service assistance. We help them with information. We help them with information about unemployment insurance, disability, um, vocational training. So if they're interested in changing occupations, we refer them to supportive services and organizations. We help them with their farm worker rights and labor law information. And we do assist them in filing workplace um, violation complaints. Specific to the disasters throughout California, the staff have been working in the local assistance centers um, and in addition to that, we also are the agency that apply for the National Dislocated Worker Grants. So the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act authorizes the governor to set aside up to 25% of the state's dislocated worker funds. And these funds are available exclusively to some of our partners in the local areas that experience sudden and large increases of unemployment due to natural disasters. So these funds are provided to direct services to the workers when local resources are inadequate, and it helps to meet the demand for increased career and training services. We operate that through these local um, America's job centers. So California has received a $40 million for a national dislocated worker grant that helped 51 counties clean up after the storms that we had in January and February. So the local areas worked with um, the Employment Development Department, our agency, to fund and hire close to 2,000 unemployed workers in those affected areas. So they worked on temporary jobs to help with the various cleanups and repair projects on public and tribal lands. So as Dad, Dan had stated um, earlier, he talked about the watershed restoration and public land restoration. This is the type of work that we actually help with um, during the times of crisis. Just last week, we asked for the National Dislocated Worker Grant for the 2017 fires. We asked for $5 million in grant money. That is just the kickoff. That's the startup money. We have asked for an additional $35 million. So we are looking at $40 million to assist with um, the, the fire 
assistance and to hire unemployed workers in the affected area to fill temporary jobs for the cleanup and the repair projects. So the EDD actually plans to ask the Department of Labor, our federal agency, for a waiver that would allow these workers to do work on um, private lands. In the past, this has only been good for public and tribal properties. So we're hoping that the Department of Labor will actually give us a waiver and say that we can use some of these individuals to help with the cleanup on private land. So as you can see, and as Michelle also indicated, EDD has a large significant role in the wake of disasters. We've lived through floods, we've lived through fires, and yes, we even have dealt with earthquakes. Um, and it does seem to create an unanticipated workload that definitely requires a nimble workforce, and that's what the state employees have a desire to do in fulfilling and helping out our communities. Our, our mantra is one vision, one team, EDD. So we're glad to be here and be able to provide you with the information, not only on disaster unemployment insurance, but what we can do to help um, rebuild the community. Perfect. Diane, thank you so much. Secretary Ross. Just thinking about this massive rebuilding and uh, the need for construction workers and all aspects of that, and I know that you've had some very aggressive vocational training programs. Is there something in particular for the construction trades? <laughs> One of the things that EDD has been working with is specifically working with our partners, the, um, the Workforce Innovations and Opportunity Act. They basically get the money to retrain individuals, and we have programs that have been in place over the number of years for retraining, specifically for um, the construction industry. One of the things that we have been doing is working with our community colleges. We've also been working with the high schools. So we're trying to get them even at the, um, at the high school level to start looking at vocational training and then working on in with the community colleges to complete that training. We also have apprenticeship programs. We have individuals who may be eligible for unemployment insurance at the same time that they're being retrained. So there is a, a significant amount of um, wraparound services that we can provide to individuals who are um, ready to come out in the, uh, into the construction. Um, I was at a meeting last week, and one of the things that they were um, concerned about, and, and um, I think it will be significant, is we find that there's going to be contractors who may be coming into the area, and we'll be looking for places to stay and we'll be looking to put up crews, and the housing is going to be a, a significant challenge. Um, so that's, that's one of the things. I think what we're finding is that there are um, already companies who are asking about what can I do, who do I talk to, and it sounds like OES is working on, on um, working with the locals, the planning, um, that, those types of things. So it sounds like some of the planning and design need to come into place first before we could hit the ground running to be able to start staffing and sending people in. Until you know what exactly you're going to be doing, you can't really bring in the labor force to do it. Ashley. Um, so it's, it sounds like there's quite an impressive array of p potential assistance uh, for a lot of folks. What I've been really concerned about in, um, is the undocumented folks that are in that region. And so which, if any, of your services are available to them? And if you're not aware of which are, what is available to, I think, a pretty significant number of undocumented folks? The unemployment insurance program does require individuals to be legally authorized to work. Um, that's basically a federal law. Um, we're governed by federal statutes, and then it's also in our state law. Um, so for both the regular state unemployment insurance as well as the federal disaster unemployment assistance. Um, so yes, bottom line, they have to be legally authorized to, to qualify for those programs. Um, we ha There is other information through, I think, you mentioned the 211 program. I know through um, CalWORKS, there's some, I'm not an expert on all of those programs, but there is information. I know if you go to the DSS um, website about their assistance and, and what their legal requirements are. So I think there are some programs out there that can, can assist those who are undocumented. Uh, Don Bransford and then Nancy. 
<laughs> oh, sorry, Don Cameron, sorry. My apologies. Yeah, it's easy to get us confused. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I've got a couple questions. One, uh, Jackie and Jim, you, you mentioned that um, that you have to qualify for the program. So there's no waiver for the existing qualifications in a disaster situation like this. So you're, you're going to be looking at AGI and all the other components that go with FSA and NRCS uh, for a program like this? Yes. No waivers whatsoever. So, just curious. Um, uh, in terms of eligibility, no. But we right, eligibility, you still have the same yeah. issues. Okay. We, we can then, waiver in terms of expediting our processes, and that's what I did mention. So there are some waivers that we've already issued that are allowing us to expedite and ensure that affected landowners can move ahead and implement practices prior to actually receiving financial assistance. But when it comes to eligibility, none of our programs authorize us to waive some of that basic eligibility requirement. Right. In other words, yeah, I, like in your traditional programs where someone could start, it's rare that that happens, but you, you are allowing that work to be done before funding is approved. Yes, we're All waiving right. that requirement. And then you said you were tapped out on 2017. Your emergency funding is essentially gone. So all of this funding is going to come from 2018 and so is that a long process that funding won't be received until sometime in 2018 for these programs? You go first, Jackie. Okay. Uh, I did mention uh, that we've already received $4 million for our catastrophic fire recovery program. So that's available now. Uh, again, it's going to that's why the waivers are critical for us in terms of authorizing folks to go ahead because our, our process itself, even though we have the money, is not going to put a contract in place prior to when they need to implement, in particular, erosion control measures that you know we all understand need to go in before the winter and, and the rains arrive. So, uh, yeah, it's more of our process. It's, it's, it's probably the, the limiting factor there, and that's why the waivers are real critical. But, yeah, we, we've got money. Uh, on the EWP front, on the emer emergency watershed uh, protection program, that works on an almost on an as-needed basis. Sometimes we have carryover, you know, from prior years. Sometimes when the incidents get so large, we'll, we'll go and ask Congress for additional appropriations. So uh, that that one's on a kind of on a on-demand uh, basis. And then <clears throat> another question: that talk about unemployment uh, benefits and filling out forms. So what happens when these, I mean, and I'm sure there's a, a good answer, but their houses are gone. Where do they get their mail? Where do they, what address do you, do you re get your mail? I mean, I'm, I'm sure it's been taken care of. No, somewhere. I mean, that is a very valid question. We, um, have, we advise individuals when we talk to them, they can use general delivery at a, a local post office. We will mail their um, documents, um, even their debit card there. That's acceptable. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Um, on these programs, you talked about waivers, and, and I know on the equip program, sometimes it has to be an individual landowners and uh, that, that applies for the funding. In a catastrophic event like this, um, I would think that some of the local agencies would like to tackle some of these equip issues. Um, water quality, what have you, on, on a more regional basis, uh, and they could they could expedite that if they didn't have to round up every landowner to get a signature on. So I, I'm curious, and you, you did mention on the uh, emergency watershed program that you do have a local sponsor, so that's a, so, so there you have that. But what about on the equip side? Can you waive the individual requirement and take it on as a regional uh, project? Not really. Um, w w there are arrangements that can be made. This takes some some delicate negotiations where an individual landowner can represent neighbors, right? So uh, w we, we've set contracts up in that way, and that requires some documentation from the neighbors, right, that they're on board and in an agreement with what uh, that, but 
by and large, yeah, our process does require us to deal individually with landowners. It's not like, and other entities are not even eligible. So you, you have to be a landowner. So government entities, others aren't even eligible for the EQIP funding. Where EWP, yes, we, we're required to run it through uh, a local municipality and, and individual landowners aren't even eligible for the, the emergency watershed uh, program. So they're, they're, the design is very different between so the two programs. But on the EW, um, PP, or is it PP or PS, but it's anyway. On EWP, or Emergency Watershed Program, right. On that, you have a local sponsor that puts up the cost share money. and 25%, the, correct. And then the individuals come in with their cost share. No. Know, it's just a region. No, we, for coming. example, you know, in Sonoma County, let's say, uh, or well, let's do Lake County, since we do have a local sponsor. That's the city of Clear Lake right now. They're, they're our sponsor. They've agreed to cover that 25% match. Uh, it's a reimbursement program. So, you know, once we agree on the project and, and the design and all that's in place, they go get the work done. They submit us, you know, to, to us the receipts, invoices, and we pay directly the city of Clear Lake. So I have uh, Bryce Lundberg and the National Board. And Rochelle. Impressive uh, number of, of programs and um, and opportunities to uh, respond to the um, to the disaster. Oh, I was wondering, are there other there are other programs that uh, are tracked by state officials on un, that that are underutilized in California? Do your do your uh, feeling or your experience that that these programs are being utilized to the full extent of of their um, capability by those affected, or do you feel like it's they're underutilized? Uh, at this time, yeah, anyone? Um. Yeah, I'll, I'll say that our our loan our loan programs are definitely underutilized by farmers. Farmers don't think of themselves as you know USDA loan customers. They have financing with their uh, commercial lender, but we can we can. There was some talk earlier, you know, we with SBA, we could make a bridge loan, you know, um, and we can term that out to not be due until you're going to receive your cost share benefit because sometimes you have your farm ownership loan with First Northern and you've got your operating loan, and but the bank really isn't willing to go another 50000 another 100000 and what we don't want is for farmers to put that money on credit cards. That's not a reasonable rate or term. If you can't receive funding at reasonable rates or terms, you are eligible for a farm service agency loan. So that is an extremely underutilized program. I know that a lot of people don't want to get a loan from SBA or anybody else right now. Times are perilous as far as businesses and homeowners go. But it's, it's very important that people understand that this is the federal assistance that's being offered. And we can lend much more than you can get as a grant from FEMA or other agencies. If a homeowner does not qualify for a loan or a renter, we can refer them back to FEMA for other assistance grant consideration. But so many people don't turn in their SBA applications, and then they're kind of left in the breeze. Um, so businesses especially should apply to SBA, and also for homeowners and renters, we are a resource for them, but a lot of people just don't want. <laughs> so get the applications in. You don't have to take a loan if you don't want it, but the money's there if yeah, you need it. That's what we tell people. Diane, I was wondering, you're tracking the um, businesses that were impacted. I was wondering if you have a number of jobs that have been lost due to the, um, due to the fires. We don't have anything specifically yet. I had one of my staff just do a little informal poll of um, the number of unemployment insurance claims that happened to be filed uh, the week before and then the weeks after the fire. Um, and 
I, I was the most curious about ag. I really wanted to know about our, our farm workers and what the impacts were. But during the week of the fire, what we found was that there was about 4,355 unemployment insurance claims that were filed. And that was just during that week. So there still was a workload that we hadn't processed um, that might not have gotten processed for a while. But out of that, um, there was only 154 of them were ag workers. We do track um, by a code when they file for unemployment insurance who is in what industry. So um, like I said, I was very curious. By the, by the time that the next week came and things started mitigating a little bit, the claims dropped a little bit to 1,900 and then they went down to 700. But we know that they're still going up and they're still tracking up because we do have all of the workload that we're still working on and we're still processing. But that was just a real quick moment in time that we did um, zip codes. But um, I'm hoping by the end of this week that we'll have more specifics Looking at the number of employers that were just in that area geographically, um, according to zip code, uh, you know, there's hundreds of thousands. Uh, you know, there's little mom and pops that you never even know are there um, because you're thinking of the large employer or the, you know, the the hotel that burned down and and that that type of thing. So there are th there's a lot of the hidden economy that you just don't even know is out there. So unfortunately, I don't have any of those numbers yet, but we're processing to see what we can find out. And um, Ashley Warren. Yes, because, because this was, yeah. yeah, but because a lot of farm workers live in the Palos Verde area, for example, or in Lake County in San Juan. So because the fires were so broad, I would say the vast majority, there are some who will come over from Lodi in the Valley. All right, we have a, two last questions, one from Ashley and one from Michelle. Uh, mine was a follow-up to Don's earlier question, which is, um, are the resource conservation districts a vehicle, and are you partnering with them to try to get equip out to more farmers more quickly and some of the practices they can do before the rain? Oh, most definitely, yeah. Principally through our cooperative agreements, we're able to um, enter into these financial or, you know, agreements with districts to um, enlist them, really, because, again, um, in terms of our base staffing capability, we're just not in a position to be able to respond to the demand. And so oftentimes districts are uh, very critical for us to rely on and, and enlist them and helping us do the follow-up, do the, you know, um, reach, re reach out to the landowners and help facilitate that uh, application process, no question about it. And do you have cooperative agreements with all those districts in the affected regions? Yeah, I, I don't know um, at, at present, but I, I know we're working on them. <laughs> you know, at the, as we start a new fiscal year, you know, things are a little more problematic for us in terms of getting those types of financial instruments in place. But I, 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 I know for Mendocino and Lake, we had uh, agreements already in place with those districts. I'm not as familiar with uh, Sonoma and Napa and those counties, but I, I suspect it's, it's true as well. And our last question from Rochelle. Uh, this is actually a follow-up to Board Member Cameron's question also regarding 1718 um, funding. Um, given that most of you are federal funded, and I don't know if EDD, you get some WIOA dollars possibly. It, what are you anticipating? I mean, the, the, the House just passed a budget. We're hearing of the cuts, um, knowing that there is disaster occurring in, in our nation. Um, what are you hearing up on the Hill? <laughs> no one wants to touch that question. <laughs> um, the word that we just got this week was that we, EDD for Workforce Services, was going to be okay. Um, what was proposed was the complete elimination of the um, employment service function. So it was, um, we, were, we were to be zeroed out, so we would no longer, you would no longer have the um, job service or employment service agency. Um, but what we're hearing is that it's ne all a negotiation, um, and we had a small cut but any cut has an impact on the number of um, employees that can work in each one of those um, 
America's Job Centers of California. We found that at some point in time with the um, local assistance centers that were set up, we were running out of bodies. And a, a lot of it was, you know, the 12-hour days, seven days a week. Um, we try to discourage overtime because it is so cost prohibitive to our budget. But um, like Don had said, the, the staff were truly devoted to their communities. Um, my manager in Santa Rosa specifically was running into the office and then running home and packing her car because she'd been evacuated and then running back to the office and then running back home to unpack. So um, the cuts would be significant if there are any at all. So we're, we're holding our breath. For the, the Farm Service Agency, our um, uh, cost assistance for replacing uh, trees and vines, um, livestock indemnity for reimbursement for livestock deaths, and emergency livestock assistance to um, help with the, the uh, cost of, of lost feed and hay, those are all fully funded. Uh, there is no... Uh, a specific agency budget for those items. Every payment that we issue to a farmer for those payments are drawn directly on the federal treasury. So there is no limit to those programs. The program that is not funded is our emergency conservation program, and that's where we'll do the debris removal, the pump replacement, the fence replacement, and that is not funded under the continuing resolution. So it can't be funded until we have a budget in place, and that's why I say we don't know the dollar amount we'll pay for debris removal or the dollar amount we'll pay per linear foot of fence until we know what our allocation is. We've sent in our requests and our first requests have been approved, just not funded. All right, well, panel, thank you so much for all of your information and talking about the programs that are available. We greatly appreciate it. And if you could share some of the information I know that you mentioned in terms of some of the open houses that you'll be doing or um, in the coming month, if you can get that information to me, that would be great so we can help distribute it, and that applies for all of your agencies. Thank you so much. It was greatly appreciated. Okay. And now before we uh, break for lunch, we're going to start our discussion on water fix, and we look forward to hearing from um, Carla Nima, who is the Deputy Secretary for Water Policy at the California Natural Resources Agency, and also the Governor's Senior Advisor on Water Policy. Carla, thank you so much for being here, either at the podium or the table, whichever you okay. prefer. All right, this is good. It's on. <laughs> Hi. Um, <clears throat> well, I've been here a few times over the years reporting in on our water fix uh, progress, and um, we are now really getting into kind of the closing little over a year with Governor Brown. So I'm, I'm glad to report we are, um, we've hit several key milestones over the course of the last year and we are um, working very intently to get through, entirely through the permitting process in the remaining months of the, of the Brown administration. Um, you've probably been reading a little bit about our our process in, in the newspaper, so um, it's especially, I'm especially um, grateful to be here to kind of let you know how we see the project developing and some of the key, um, key issues that are going to um, continue to appear in front of our local water district boards as we get to um, additional decisions uh, on the project. So I'll back up for a minute and just describe um, some of the key milestones we've reached in the last year. Uh, last December, we certified the environmental documents, the uh, CEQA document and the NEPA document. Um, just give me a sign if I'm using too many acronyms. Um, we also um, completed our permitting under state and federal endangered species laws, and that's um, biological opinions from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and National Marine Fisheries Service. Um, those were completed in June. Um, shortly thereafter, uh, we completed what's called a 2081 permit, an incidental take permit under state uh, endangered species uh, law. Um, 
those permits were important for us to move forward with uh, the Water Resources Control Board and, um, our, and their um, processing of our change in point of diversion uh, application. So you may recall that process, uh, the change in point of diversion was submitted, um, I believe summer of 2016. We started on, it was divided into two parts, um, both critical for uh, state decision making. The first um, essentially being a, a process whereby the water board um, hears from multiple parties and makes a determination around whether or not the project and its proposed operations will harm other water rights holders. Um, that was described as kind of part one of a fairly lengthy uh, water rights proceeding. Uh, that water fix is required to go through. Um, part two of that will now address the estuarine and species considerations. Um, so again, how the project is proposed to operate and its effects on um, all kinds of species in the Delta, not limited to uh, threatened and endangered species. But we did need to hit that uh, permit. We needed to have the biological opinions and the uh, California ESA permit to help us move and have all the, uh, all the information to present for this part two of the water board proceeding. Um, and that proceeding will start uh, January of, of 2018. So um, all of those pieces uh, were critical uh, points to get to what I would describe as kind of a first round of uh, decision making on the part of the water districts who are expected to pay for the project. Um, several districts took the proposed project to their boards um, starting in September and running all the way through uh, late October. Um, this was uh, at the request of the Brown administration. Now that we had the permits, we needed to have a better discussion with the water districts on their actual interest in investing in the project. So um, I'm fairly certain you all would be aware that um, Westlands was the first to consider the project and, and they opted to not go forward um, in pursuit of, of water fix and I'll get back to that in a moment. Um, that subsequent um, water districts that considered the project um, were ones associated with the state water project. And as of uh, late October, we are about 85% subscribed, if you will, on the state water project's table A water supplies. So that is 84% um, or 85% of the uh, state water project water deliveries um, would those entities that have those contracts are willing to invest in their proportional share of water fix. Um, the uh, Kern County Water Agency is um, essentially uh, comprises that remaining 15% that is a, on the state water project side that is as yet unsubscribed. Um, and that roughly translates into um, within Kern County, their water agency um, supported uh, 48 and a half percent of their investment in water fix. So um, the state has been um, working with our water contractors to understand those you know, two important pieces. Um, the state water contractors portion of the project and of course the uh, Central Valley projects portion of uh, water fix expenses. So um, on the state water project side we are um, busy working with the contractors and the Department of Water Resources to sort out. We have um, the cost allocation process for the state water contractors is something that um, they brought to the Department of, Resor of Water Resources and they call it an uh, opt-out uh, kind of program. In other words, um, as this project is um, uh, under consideration to be owned and operated by the state water project in the state of California. It's considered an improvement to the existing state water project and if you are effectively sort of in the project, um, unless you can find a partner 
um, who wants to buy your water supply benefit from WaterFix in, in the form of a, a water transfer. So that's what we are working on um, with the Kern County Water Agency and those agricultural districts that um, as of at this point are not uh, are not interested in, in essentially buying the water supply reliability benefit of WaterFix. On the federal side, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, and uh, I think the best place to understand, I think, where the federal government is as it relates to water fix is the Bureau of Reclamation um, put out a, a letter to their contractors in mid-September, which was describing the Bureau of Reclamation's participation in the project. And um, they said kind of multiple things in that letter that um, aren't necessarily in sync with one another. Um, so broad brush, they essentially uh, did not identify um, any project benefits from water fix um, to the refuge water supply, uh, refuge water supplies, exchange water contractors, or the CVP in total. So there are certain ways in which the CVP operates um, where costs are allocated across CVP parties that are, are meant to support the, the CVP kind of writ large, some of its environmental um, requirements of the project and other such things. Um, so they made that determination, um, but then they also made the determination that um, they didn't necessarily want to kind of opt out of the project altogether, um, meaning they did not want to at this point provide uh, CVP contractors who were interested in funding the tunnel project um, exclusive use of water that the Bureau might move through the tunnels. So uh, I think, to put it in colloquial terms, we got really stuck on the federal side. Um, and I think that, and I think you're going to hear from uh, Friant a little bit later, and I, I know Friant will have its own perspective on the project. and our relationship with the CVP and the Bureau of Reclamation and how to potentially um, move their portion of the project forward. Um, so those discussions are, are ongoing and we, uh, I guess in a certain way, I, th I think we would say it's, um, it's a good thing that the Bureau doesn't want to opt out, uh, but we really are getting to the point where they need to describe their ability to opt in so we know how to move forward. Um, <clears throat> so the water fix as it's currently configured, the 9,000 cubic feet per second capacity, the three intakes, the, the dual tunnels is still the project that, that we are pursuing. Um, we have funding organized around this 85% of the state water project portion working on filling that out so that the, at least the state water contractor side is 100% subscribed. And then um, we there's been a lot of consideration around is it possible to stage the construction of the project to enable the Bureau of Reclamation to have a little bit more time to sort out uh, how it would participate financially. Um, there's been a lot of conversations about um, a smaller facility to do that, so it is possible that we would um, we would pursue a 6,000 um, cubic feet per second facility in a first phased construction and then the remaining added capacity um, once the Bureau sorted out uh, how it would participate. Um, so fundamentally we're still in front of the water board with the same project as described and, and working on those details, pending conversations both with the federal government, the Bureau of Reclamation and CVP and within our own uh, state water contractors. I should also say that, um, you know, one of the things, and this will be, I think, m more germane for you all, is we are still uh, sorting out financing programs um, that can um, help ag in particular participate in the project. Um, there are some federal programs that are low or no cost loan programs that are on our radar as um, could be very important mechanisms to um, maintain the cost of the project in a way that's going to enable ag to participate. 
Um, cost containment is always a uh, issue of concern. Um, the water contractors brought that as an issue um, uh, to the state, and um, one of the things that we agreed upon was to enable the water contractors to um, participate more fully in a separate joint powers authority to design and construct the facility. Um, that was uh, in response to their interest in um, you know, essentially having more accountability for delivering a project that's um, on time and on budget. So um, that was a, a pretty important development, I think, for the water users to um, really be able to engage with more confidence that um, the project is, is going to come in and it's going to be, it's going to be affordable. Um, those issues, I think, are still uh, uh, overarching financing issues and overarching financing plan is still um, under development. Um, so is a more uh, a broader kind of um, cost benefit analysis. We've had a little bit of chicken and egg discussion around um, how to pull that information together. Um, it's important that we can describe to the public the way in which this will be funded, the way it will be financed, and that um, it provide the cost benefit for the project means that it makes sense. Um, but without greater specificity among participating water districts, it was very difficult to uh, assemble that kind of information. So um, our hope is that we will have that kind of information, particularly on the cost benefit side, to share uh, in the beginning part of, of next year. It really is pending added conversations around what to do with the CVP portion of the project and, of course, this remaining unsubscribed state water project portion. Um, I think that's, um, that's a good snapshot of where we are. Uh, I'd be glad to answer any questions, um, but um, I'll just let you know that the governor calls regularly for status updates of the project. Why is it taking so long? Um, so he's, um, he's committed um, absolutely um, through next year, and we're going to um, bring this project to close as quickly as we can and as, um, with as much public confidence as we can, particularly among the water users we'll be asking to invest in the project, as well as, um, as those water users in other parts of the state that um, have sort of all along had very specific concerns that the project not harm them. Now, this water board proceeding um, that starts in, uh, up again in late January, our expectation is it will close by the end of next year. Um, the water board will write an order that would condition the project so that it does not harm other water users. We've been very focused on trying to settle out those disputes. Parties bring protests. Um, into the room and there's uh, an opportunity. The Bureau is still very much part of that change petition process, so they're very much at the table. Um, but one of the things that will make us successful in bringing that part of the uh, permit to closure by the end of next year is our ability to, to settle with other parties. Um, so that will be, uh, that will be significant. Um, the last um, permit that we need is um, a certification of uh, consistency with the Delta plan. Uh, so we are working with the Stewardship Council um, in advance of submitting our application, and um, we anticipate putting that application in uh, sometime in the spring, April or May, and that will uh, initiate their process. Um, my expectation is, um, is that will be appealed and there will be a, a public process that the council will want to engage in a public process before they make that determination of uh, consistency with the Delta plan. So a few more pieces to put together, but um, as I like to say, w w sincerely, um, but as someone who's been doing this for a long time, we're closer than we've ever been. <laughs> uh, and it's hugely important uh, to California and to uh, help really build out a lot of very uh, important additional investments in water infrastructure, uh, sustainable groundwater management, um, conservation and other recycled water, other, other key features of the California Water Action Plan. I'll stop there. Well, Carla, thank you so much. I know that Don had a question and then uh, Nancy, Don Cameron. 
Thank you, Carla, that, that's really helpful. Um, if the project's not fully subscribed, mm -hmm. um, you know, is there a point? <laughs> What's that? You want to buy some, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> But um, is there a point where if it's not fully subscribed, it won't uh, go, it'll go at a different level? Uh, what do you see looking forward? Yeah, I mean, we can, you know, we can really only build what we have a financial commitment for. So, you know, if it's not fully subscribed, you know, our, our options would be to stage the construction to enable if there's additional assessment that needs to be made. But, you know, if there is assessment and the assessment is, you know, we don't want to pay for that project, you know, then, you know, folks will have to accept the reduced reliability over time and, and you know, there won't, there won't be a project. Um, or, or there could be a project that's a uh, smaller size. As you know, we have a legendary environmental document of 90,000 pages <laughs> and lots of alternatives. I think we have 15. It's like nine straight up alternatives and then six sub alternatives. So we've looked at a lot. Um, I would think that if we needed to transition to a smaller project, we would find um, pretty good footing given all the work that we've done developing those alternatives in the environmental document. And that, that would set the schedule back, so. Right, and, and you, you mentioned Wesson's earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, their reasoning was cost of water primarily, and do you think they're really out, or uh, <laughs> what do you think's going on there? What do I think? Well, that's the sixty-four thousand dollar question. I um, honestly, I don't, I don't know. Um, I would echo, you know, what I've heard of Mr. Birmingham's conversation in front of um, his board is that there isn't another deal out there. Um, you know, we've been putting everything on the table. Um, we think it's a good project. We think the West Side uh, needs the project. Um, but there is no question for smaller growers, it's, it's tough, or growers that have other um, water supplies or more, more choices to make about where they do their farming. We want it here in California. We have severe groundwater issues in, in that part of the state. Um, so I think some of it's coming to understand that um, without a solution, without a physical solution in the Delta, um, the consequences over time are probably more dire than, um, you know, than people necessarily want to confront at the moment. Nancy. Perfect segue to my concern. So thank you very much for your presentation. I know this is an immensely complicated issue. Um, but as late as this morning, the Sacramento Bee has an article about the one tunnel, two tunnel mm -hmm. fix. And the whole article is always the same um, depiction of the issue between fish and farming. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I'm in Southern California. Am I overreacting when I am concerned that I might be an endangered species because of the fragility of the levees? Why? Uh, I shouldn't say why, but I'm very concerned that the public is not understanding the drinking water peril. Mm -hmm. So are you the correct person to <laughs> <laughs> yeah. champion this cause. <laughs> no, I agree. Um, I agree it does get, you know, boiled down to that. And I think part of that's the shorthand because, you know, the conversation is different in the ag community. That said, there are, you know, urban, you know, urbanized community and agricultural districts that actually rely on this as their water supply. Um, city of Fresno has expressed interest. I mean, you know, it's a different dynamic because there are rate payers over which you can spread the costs. But I think that's partly why it gets um, a little bit kind of lost in the shuffle. Uh, I would say my own view on this, um, you know, one tunnel, two tunnel farm fish construct is, you know, my own view is it's, it's, it's better to have uh, more parties have access to what is fundamentally a more benign, environmentally benign point of diversion for this water. Um, and not to mention the, uh, the protection against sea level rise over time and, and earthquake risk and other things. I just think it's, 
it's better to not bifurcate the projects again when I believe the the pumps in the South Delta have they do have a limited lifespan um, they do present some fundamental challenges and it's not it's not good to leave people out so my fervent hope is we can find a way to bring those parties in and you know and build the full project I don't know if I don't know if they'll do it but that's you know just a follow-up to be clear so my concern is the fragility of the levees mm -hmm. and the drinking water supply to Southern California. Am I over concerned? No, you're not over concerned. Um, but Southern California is, you're going to hear from uh, the Met Chairman Randy Record, and um, they're in the project. I think their vote was 68 or 69 percent in favor of the project. So I think Southern California is making a good decision. Um, for that reasons and, and a bunch of other reasons related to the Colorado and water quality there and all of that combines to create um, good drinking water quality or water that can be treated within a reasonable cost. It's a great um, drought insurance supply for Southern California. Um, so absolutely, it's critical, it's critical. I, I just think it plays that way in the paper because that's the point of conflict. Um, and you'd hear more about drinking water if, um, if we were having similar dynamics with um, some of the larger urban agencies, not sure whether or not they wanted to pay for that. Okay. So I have Bryce and then Eric. Carla, thank you for coming today and, and thank you for your leadership. Uh, for sure appreciate uh, Governor Brown's leadership in this and that I do agree that this is the time to complete this uh, project and uh, complete other policies related to water that have been gunned and uh, I hope are completed uh, before Governor Brown leaves office. Uh, thank you for making comment related to no harm. Um, several in Northern California um, that I participate with in NACWA, Northern California Water Association and others, um, we, I, generally speaking, have no opposition to this project uh, as far as it going forward and, uh, and being an important project to California. The concern is related to harm and whether or not the, um, the project has the ability to have un, uh, unintended consequences or impacts upstream. Mm -hmm. And uh, I liken it to um, the project to a, uh, a, a powerful sports car or maybe even a luxury sports car that, that can do speeds of 200 miles per hour. Uh, but that car has, um, has agreement or drivers do to, uh, to um, when they're school zones or in residential zones to go slower. They have to obey the stop signs and uh, uh, start and stop. And it's, I think, our concern that those sorts of agreements haven't been uh, fully vetted. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and so your comments related to, uh, to no harm, uh, you do anticipate uh, engaging. Um, and I think our, our thoughts is we'd love to remove our protests. Mm -hmm. We'd love to remove our opposition. And we've just been requesting those sorts of engagements. What are, you, what, are your, what are your thoughts? We're going to continue to work on that. That's the direction from the administration to the department, and um, they've got to work hand in hand with the bureau. Um, so that's our goal, Bryce, is to remove the maximum amount of protests as possible. Because I think ultimately those things become better on if it's generated by a settlement. It's better understood. It's more durable over time. Um, you know, we're all going to be surprised by California's hydrology. There's no question. I mean, <laughs> so, um, to me, I think it's important if we have a, a foundation that's born of settlement and an equal understanding of risks across the board. It's a, it's a better construct for doing the work that we're going to have to do over time and, you know, more precisely how we operate these facilities in circumstances that we haven't yet confronted. So. Eric? Yeah, it's sort of a technical question to start and then a more less technical question. The first is the the scaling down option with maybe one tunnel instead of two. How much yeah. is how much of the two tunnel option is about volume, and how much is about redundancy and resilience? Um, it's it's both. Um, so with the nine thousand um, CFS configuration, you know, 
a 9,000 CFS tunnel is probably, a pro I'm not an engineer, but it's a pretty darn big boring machine. <laughs> boring machine. Um, and, uh, you know, when we move it down to a 6,000 CFS, that becomes, I think, a little bit more doable to maintain it as a one tunnel kind of structure. Um, there is a redundancy f with two tunnels where if something is down for maintenance, you still have the ability to use it, move water. Um, you know, one tunnel doesn't carry that benefit. How that benefit is valued and to which party, since there are different, um, one of the things I've, I've learned a tremendous amount about is just the different degrees of reliability in different parts of the state pending investments that have been made locally. So it remains to be seen, and I think this is one of the issues to explore a little bit in an overall cost benefit, is if we did alter the configuration and, and bring it down to one tunnel and lose that redundancy, you know, you would lose some amount of benefit, how that's valued, how it works into the overall math, I don't quite know yet. but. But um, it does, the other piece of um, the, you know, moving it to a one tunnel 6,000 is it does reduce the cost. And um, some of the preliminary numbers that I've seen is it's, it's pretty cost competitive with the 9,000 CFS, maybe even, I mean, really around the edges a tiny bit cheaper, um, but very much amount around the margins. Um, but, you know, the dual tunnel at 6,000, you know, it, it, it really does become increasingly expensive and for n not that much additional benefit. So that's why we're kind of headed, that's why I think that's got sort of the most traction in terms of something we might pursue if we can't ultimately um, identify the willing participants in funding the current project. My follow-up, I'm sorry, the, <laughs> the second part of the question was around, and it's related to this because it's, it seems like the, the Lack of agreement on the part of the federal partners is a is a is an issue. How much? I mean, is it possible to comment on how much of that is sort of technical and engineering versus political and um, the the difficulty in the federal government making commitments beyond you know beyond well a particular here, political time frame. Here's what I would say: is it is it is really complicated. The CVP part of the system is just. Different. If they had a cost allocation the same as the state water project, so the state water project, everyone, you have your contracted amount, but if it's X kind of water year type, everybody's getting the same percentage of their contract. So it's a little, it's quite a bit more straightforward than the CVP, which layers in um, seniority and a priority system. It also has kind of a bucket of operational choices that it makes that benefits the CVP in total. I don't claim to understand all those nuances, um, but it is pretty complicated. So I, I have a degree of uh, sympathy for an incoming federal administration. Um, California water is kind of brutal. Uh, Bureau of Reclamation, you know, operating here, it's, you know, they, they kind of wander into, you know, a group of parties that don't always get along and, you know, they suddenly are right in a kind of a mediation mode. Um, the prior administration had years to figure this out. They didn't do it. So um, I don't necessarily think it's, um, it's particularly political with this administration and the Brown administration. Again, that's my view. Um, I think the issues are difficult on the CVP side. I think that um, given the nature of the planning process, um, you know, if you kind of hindsight being 2020, you know, part of the challenge being when you're putting together the planning process and parties are paying into that planning process. I mean, Westlands, I think they paid about $60 million over the last, however, decade of planning. It's not insignificant by any stretch. Um, you know, but those parties became pretty, south of the Delta became very well versed and operations and if you move this knob it does this this is where you're surprised this is where you're not so surprised um, and then you know we put out biological opinions 10 years later and there's a whole other part of the CVP that 
you know, is looking at that kind of information really for the first time. I mean, we did a decade of planning in the context of a habitat conservation plan, which allows for a lot more back and forth than a traditional Section 7 Endangered Species Act approach. So we had some parties, uh, some CVP contractors that were sort of very well versed in the system and how it was going to work, but a whole bunch of them really weren't brought along. Um, and so here we are in, you know, the middle of 2017, we have a new federal administration and um, some, a lot of the CVP that's trying to dig into information that's pretty important to them for the first time. Um, and I think that has set us up for a lot more challenges and kind of these closing months and closing year than you know would otherwise we we'd, we'd want to have at the moment um, so I think um, you know I've been talking to you know various CVP parties um, intermittently over the last several months and um, you know they're looking for some more leadership I think from the Bureau and what they see their future um, like with or without the project. I've heard the regional director say multiple times that without water fix or something a lot like it, um, the CVP, their challenges are just gonna be just intensifying exponentially. So they understand that. Um, as I said, I think the struggle is they understand that, but and they don't wanna opt out of it, but they have not figured out a framework to opt into it in terms of how they think about the benefits, if those benefits don't materialize, are there off ramps or, you know, what, you know, and this, all of this is some measure of, um, some measure of faith. Um, we know a lot, but our information is imperfect. Um, and it's our job to try and make good decisions with that available to us. And, you know, that's what we're, hoping the uh, federal government can bring to the table in a time frame that helps this project go forward. I think that's really helpful, thank you. Okay. Uh, we have Don Bransford and Joyce Stoughton. Morning, thanks for coming. Yeah. Appreciate your presentation. Um, can you talk a little bit about the opt-out program that you're working on with the state contractors? I, I'm not familiar with that and and I guess my question on that is if I'm a contractor and I opt out, do I still get my same water supply that I contracted for? And the only thing- Yeah, it becomes less reliable over time. So to the extent that, um, you know, we're not able to divert. So a good specific example in recent history was the beginning of 2016, in January, February, um, we had some restrictions on the South Delta pumps um, we lost about 480,000 acre feet of water that if we had had the tunnels in place and we, we have lots of outflow going, it's not a time of year when we're kind of worried about that piece of it, but we could have moved that water while protecting uh, conditions appropriately in the South Delta. So if you're a party that you know, <coughs> decided not to buy that benefit, you're not gonna see that water that's moved through the tunnels. That's not gonna become part of your contracted amount. So, um, you know, there's so many modeling permutations and things are done on a monthly time step. It misses a certain dynamism of the system. But, you know, if you're, if you're a state water contractor who decides that um, you, some of them can't afford it, but some of them it's also, especially down in Kern, different setup with the groundwater bank, um, other surface water rights, et cetera, um, you know, there are growers down there who can say, well, I can, I can live with um, a decreasing reliability of the supply that I get through the Delta because I'm gonna manage my other water supplies in such a way and to manage around that. Other people can't manage around that. So um, yeah, so for folks who essentially decide to opt out, um, they would you know, effectively enter into a, a transfer term not yet determined, but kind of under discussion, a transfer term with a party that does want that benefit. It is in certain ways kind of a natural for some ag to urban. Um, it could be ag to ag. 
it really depends on you know what people think about a lot of the urban it's a it's a dry year supply um, so how do you do these trades um, and get it get the benefit to a party that is a willing investor okay so that that then that leaves open the opportunity for a partial investment that yes. that's, I mean you know, we're, we're going through yeah. the same iteration yep. on sites that, that you're talking about yep. there. okay yep. in a strange sense you know, I think if we did end up shifting to a smaller project or some kind of a staged construction, I think we'd probably be oversubscribed in that first. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's managing all of that and doing it in a way that's um, obviously respectful of people's contracts and rights and fair. And you know, we want we want as many people who want to buy the benefit to get in the project. But it's time to for folks to make those decisions. And our last question from Joy. Um, I'm concerned about the uh, the the people upstream, mm -hmm. the watersheds. Mm -hmm. um, I don't. Perhaps I'm missing something. But is there some role or board or oversight committee or that they can be part of the planning and operation process? So uh, this gets back to the state water resources control board process. So. There are two things that are kind of that are kind of going on there related to the upstream tributaries and the delta and sort of the overlay of this project. So one is the existing water quality control plan, which is decision 1641, which essentially governs water quality um, in the delta. And so the project as before the water board now, they have to make a determination and there's language in the Delta Reform Act that also describes determinations they need to make when considering um, whether and how to permit the new points of diversion. Um, and so that's this um, change petition, so a change in point of diversion proceeding that's right now in front of the Water Board, that's been on, in front of the Water Board for uh, probably two years and I'll take another year plus where a lot of those issues are clarified and codified in a water right permit at, at the end um, and at the end b meaning before anything is constructed um, the other piece of it is this water quality control plan that um, and some of you know quite a lot about it um, but that's the setting of flow standards on tributaries and into the delta. And that, that will happen irrespective of whether or not, you know, water fix goes forward and we add the point of diversion. And that sets um, really important criteria for uh, all kinds of beneficial uses of water supplies, humans, fish, fauna, everything. Um, but at the heart of that is... Um, revised uh, in-stream flows and uh, delta flow components. Um, and the water board is also the party that, planning party that's moving that forward. So upstream um, water districts and other parties and environmental groups are, um, have been participating in that process and are, are very focused on that process. Whatever comes out of that um, will ultimately be the governance for the Delta in terms of water quality. So any kind of water fix tunnel project would ultimately have to operate to those revised standards that the water board would put forth with the engagement of a lot of the upstream parties. So that was kind of, uh, sorry to, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's just put it out there. Um, there's some overlapping regulations. There are some that are specific to actually approving a new facility. One is um, harming other water users and um, any harm to the estuary um, and specific issues that are described under the Delta Reform Act where the water board must consider flow, appropriate flows when it considers this change in point of diversion, which is a, a fundamentally a water rights proceeding for new conveyance. Separate from that, the water board is also updating its overarching water quality control plan, which balances amongst multiple beneficial uses and um, sets into motion um, new requirements for in-stream flows and flows in the delta. 
So Don promises me, Don Bransford, that this is a very yeah. short question. Sure. Just very short. Sure. I yeah. just want to emphasize Joy's comment, that, yeah. and, and you know this, yeah. that, that we are very concerned. I mean, more than concerned. Uh, we're not happy with the way the proceedings went. Uh, and actually, you know, we, we think it, this is going to get litigated. I mean, we're that concerned. Now, in the administration's defense, they have so much going on and they're understaffed and it makes it very difficult to try to, to meld all of this stuff together because it's, it's, you know, it's almost as difficult to take care of one issue and then come over here and de do, deal with another issue. And so um, it, it, it is just unbelievably complicated and, and it's taking, you know, a few people all their living hours, day or night, to to work through this, and and uh, but uh, hopefully at the end of the day there will be a melding and and a working together. And I know a lot of people are trying to make this happen, but they're also being very cautious in terms of we got to make sure we're ready for what if it doesn't because because um, it's uh, yep. there's a lot at stake for everyone closer than we've ever been. Oh. <laughs> That's a great line. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank Carla, you. thank you so much. Thank you. All right, we're going to break for lunch. Um, members of the audience and speakers, you're definitely invited to join us. Let's reconvene at uh, one ten. Thanks. All right, everyone, thank you so much for joining us as we reconvene, Don and Ashley. <laughs> I know. Um, again, thank you so much. Um, we do have some follow-up from our last um, presentation to the board. We did have a request for public comment. So, Osh, is it? Osh, oh, sorry. Um, if you can um, use the podium. <laughs> Not the agency, Not OSHA Meserve. Um, I'm a local attorney here in Sacramento, and I would stay till the very end, and I will try to stay as long as I can. Um, but I really appreciate the opportunity to just address you briefly before you get onto your panel. Um, I work with an entity called Local Agencies of the North Delta, and it's about 120,000 acres of um, reclamation and water districts in the northern part of the Delta, so just south of here um, in Sacramento uh, for all the local folks. and. Um, I just wanted to express, you know, our concerns regarding the tunnels project and um, in particular, since you are the CDFA board, um, really thinking about whether this is not just there, someone had brought up earlier the, you know, fish for farms type issue. I guess what I'm looking at as an advocate for local farmers here in our area is that it's really some farmers for other farmers. And in particular, um, there are some very adverse effects of the proposed project, whether you're looking at a 3,000 CFS, 6,000 or 9,000 CFS project. Um, very 5,000 acres of converted farmland, prime farmland here in the Delta, which you know is very productive and has plenty of water and great soil. Um, and 14 years of construction, um, literally paving over diversions and farms and homes in the Delta in order to make this happen. Despite efforts on the part of the state to try to minimize that impact, this project is just so large, there just there's some things that just can't be helped if you were to construct such a facility. In addition, the water quality impacts locally are quite bad for farmers in the Northern Delta who can now grow any crop they wish. Um, in the future, we believe that they would be constricted from growing um, crops unless they were salt tolerant like in some other areas of the state and of course farmers in this area want to maintain their very good water quality. Um, in addition there's major groundwater impacts in the Delta especially in Sacramento County where there's already overdraft. Um, if you take that much water out of the river then it lowers the stage level and it, it reduces recharge and that's an issue of course that we're going to be and we are talking about at the water board which you heard Carla talk about. Um, and there's also water level changes in the Delta, as you probably know, um, there's a lot of diversions that go into the river. And if the, these pumps are so huge, they literally lower the level of the river and make it impossible for especially the siphons and gravity pumps, which are quite um, great because they don't take any energy, 
hardly, um, but it, it affects water supply that way. In addition to the farms, there's also all the domestic municipal water supply uses around the Delta, also very concerned, and those folks are showing up at the water board. So, um, you know, I would be happy to come and help your staff put together a panel that explains some of these impacts on farming in particular that I think your board should be aware of um, before it would decide that it would support such a project as you've been hearing about today. Um, and in particular, you know, if you think that water reliability gets better for other areas of the state under a with tunnels project, I want you to understand that it gets water reliability gets worse here in the Delta. Um, and um, there are a lot of other alternatives and combinations of alternatives. And we've done a lot of work. I've been in the trenches with Carla and we all know each other for years. And I think we've made a lot of progress on a lot of things. And I think if we put that information together, we could come up with some viable alternatives and combinations of alternatives that would meet the concerns that I heard you discuss today. So again, just wanna thank you for the opportunity to address you. I'd be happy to work with folks to give you more information about the local impacts on farming and water supplies here in our area. Thank you. Perfect, thank you, Osha. <clears throat> Um, now I'd like to introduce our next uh, panel discussing a water fix. Um, we have Jay Lund, the director of the Center for Watershed Sciences at, Sciences at UC Davis. We also have Randy Record, who is the chairman of the board of directors for the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California and past president of Aqua. And Jason Phillips, the chief executive officer of the Bryant Water Authority. And you know, Jason's prior Prior to his work at Bryant, he worked for the Bureau in the Mid-Pacific region, so there's some great uh, insight there that I'm sure we'll be hearing. <laughs> so if you gentlemen could please join us at the table, that would be great. And Jay, I think we'll start off with you first, and the presentation is going to magically appear on that screen. Ooh. Ooh Lots of ways to do it. And there it is. Um, <clears throat> thank you for having me today. I'll try to speak briefly. Um, I also serve uh, on the Delta Independent Science Board for the state, and I'm not speaking in that capacity today. I'm speaking on my own loose academic canon, so to speak. <laughs> The, the for fortunate thing about tenure is whether you like or dislike whatever I have to say, Hel Helene has, has no way to reward me or to punish me. <laughs> the virtues of the university. Um, everybody takes water for the Delta. I don't need to tell, you know, to remind most people here, but but everybody does. I, we, we, everybody in the Delta, out of the Delta, north of the Delta, south of the Delta, and many of them want more water. Welcome to California. <clears throat> Delta has a whole host of problems. Um, there's a lot of physical stability problems. Uh, as I'm fond of saying, the land is subsiding and the sea level is rising. You've all had your advanced courses in fluid mechanics to know that there are problems with that on the long term. It's not unique to California. The Dutch have a similar, geologically similar Delta with a similar kinds of problems. Uh, the fortunate thing about the Netherlands is they located Amsterdam in the middle of it so that they have the heart of their civilization and the heart of their economy at that low elevations. And so they're, they're definitely going to afford to, to build levees, and they build 10,000-year levees. They don't mess with 100-year levees. They, they laugh at our levees. Um, the, the Delta obviously has problems with flooding. We had a, a little bit of that uh, this last winter. I think we, we um, got off pretty easy, frankly. It, it, it showed how well... The engineers in that part of the world have done their job over the years, but it's also we had enough troubles to illustrate the vulnerability that that region has to flooding, and <clears throat> I think it has some vulnerabilities to earthquakes as well. We haven't seen major earthquakes in the Delta, but we've seen some nearby. Um, and uh, just like with floods, there's always possibilities of bigger earthquakes than what you've ever seen before, and and for something so important as water supplies and the people in the Delta, it's, uh, those things are important. The ecosystems there are not very stable or, you know, if reflecting some of my biologist colleagues, they might say, well, yeah, they're stable now, but they're non-native. Um, 
So we have a lot of habitat alteration in terms of converting this, what was once a huge um, freshwater tidal marsh um, into agriculture for the most part. Uh, we have a lot of invasive species. If you scoop up a bunch of fish in the delta, 90% uh, of that biomass is going to be non-native fish. Uh, more so in the south and less so in the northern parts of the delta. And of, and of course, we've changed the, the water flows and the channels in the delta completely. Um, I should put a picture of, of a delta channel up here. You'll, you'll notice that it's, it's covered with rock, rock which was not native to that region, <coughs> uh, what I like to call rip riparian habitat. Um, economically, I, we've done some analysis over the years that, that shows that many of these islands are not really economically stable. If they were to fail today, the farmers would probably look at many of them and say, this is not a good business to be into. It's, it's time to get out. And that's the, been the case with several of the islands that have failed over the last decades. As the sea level rises um, and our concerns for water quality, as, as we learn more about chemistry grow, we're learning more about water quality problems in the delta and from the, the, both the salts in the delta, particularly the bromides that are coming in from the sea, as well as the organic content of, of water that's in, in an environment of peat soils. <clears throat> Plus we have growing water scarcity. So we're going to see some changes in the delta. This, this map depicts an, an image we came up with uh, some years ago. We call it the Moyle map um, of, of what might happen. And you'll see some of the subsided islands turned into deep water habitat uh, and, and several other changes. I, I see that there will be inevitably changes in the delta. Um, we, we will not be able to control all of them, but we have some ability to control some of them. And as we've seen from the discussion today and, and for the last 50 years, really, part of our problem is deciding what we want there. Um, I see three major areas for policy decisions, state policy decisions in the Delta. Uh, the first is actually the levees. You know, which of the islands are worth state money state subsidies to continue going. Uh, it's very expensive to continue all of them. Maybe not all of them are not worthwhile. Um, should I stay or should I go, I think, is the question for some of the, the least valuable islands. And then who pays it, uh, for this? <coughs> Ecosystem management, I think, is probably the area where we're the most disorganized, probably the least effective. Uh, what are we managing for? Native species, recreational fish is a champion uh, largemouth bass fishery down there, um, very economically important. Uh, where and how do we manage for which ecosystem and with what resources? We really don't have a reliable funding source for the management of the ecosystem there in, in, in comparison with water supply. And then under water supply, you, we've, we heard uh, Carla Nemeth talk about the problems of, of what to do. Uh, so today's real dilemma, and I think it is today's and for the next year or so, um, we have this opportunity for a strategic decision on water supply for the Delta. Um, is it no tunnels, one tunnel, two tunnels? Nobody's talked about three tunnels yet. Um, and then how big are they and who pays for them? Uh, that's really the, the issue here. The, we, we've had a, there's been a series of things out on the news uh, talking about the advantages and disadvantages of the different numbers of tunnels and sizes and locations. Uh, we can talk about that maybe more in Q&A with your questions, um, but those are really important. Um, people talk about dual conveyance. I, I kind of want to spell it differently sometime. <laughs> it, um, there are going to be a lot of questions. No matter what decisions are made strategically over the Delta tunnels in the coming months, um, the Delta is an inherently and eternally controversial place. There are lots of questions, lots of difficulties. There are going to be a lot of questions that emerge, it's, it's not like once they make a decision on the Delta tunnels, that that's going to be the end of the thing for the Delta. That there's still going to be controversies. There's still going to be questions. Even if you if you if you decide to build them, you're going to have to figure out how to implement that new water supply strategy. No matter which way, you're going to have question major questions on levees and ecosystems, um, and the interaction of these problems because they're all tied up in the water and land mass down there and the tides and everything else. So. To me, the, my major point, I guess, uh, official point here is, is the need for organized science and programs that help us get ahead of these issues. We have a long legacy of investing lots of money in consulting firms trying to do science. 
outside of the light of day in, in ways that are not completely informative and don't really help us get ahead of the issues and don't help uh, better inform the issues and the options available. Um, as a last point, groundwater and the delta and all water in California are really tightly, tightly bound because delta is such a hub. This is a plot of some analysis. Sorry, it's all washed out. Uh, I can get you a better copy. Um, <clears throat> we have this other big thing going on in California water that's of interest to agriculture, which is sigma, and particularly in the southern part of the Central Valley. And this is a plot from model results that, that we've gotten from federal and state agencies of how much different parts of the southern part of the Central Valley would have to reduce their water use to become in balance with Sigma, sustainable under Sigma. But given that we have flood, wet years and dry years, and we have like 2040 is the date we're supposed to all be sustainable, how do you know if you're sustainable? Maybe you've been unlucky, or maybe you've been lucky. And, or maybe one model says one thing and one model says another. And so this sort of tries to represent that uncertainty for different amounts of net water use reduction. So that includes adding additional recharge and reducing water use to show that it's, it's never going to be an easy question there. And of course, all those folks that are having to do pretty serious net water use reduction, one of their concerns is going to be, what about my delta water supplies as well? So all of these things are tied together. Resistance is futile in, in this business. There is going to be changes in the delta, just as they're going to be in groundwater. We need to be get need to prepare today for these, um, and we need to continue preparing for these problems forever and getting ahead in terms of research and, and technical enterprise. Otherwise, it's, it gets worse if you're not prepared. Um, because I'm a professor, I'll leave you with some further readings. Um, and the first of these, I think, is actually the best. It's a history of the Delta written by uh, two professors from Davis, uh, Jackson, uh, the most eminent of those. Um, and it was before the uh, peripheral canal. So. It, this, is a very, this is an eternal problem, and we have some important decisions to make in the short term, but I think we also have to prepare for the longer term. Thank you. Sounds wise. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jay. Uh, Randy, so you can either use the table or the podium, whichever you prefer. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. It's my pleasure. Um, your work to advance uh, farming and agriculture is absolutely essential in California. <clears throat> you know I'm here representing Metropolitan, but my family's been in agriculture for <clears throat> many generations. My daughters now are farming wine grapes and Paso Robles, continuing that tradition. And I hope that my role at Metropolitan is at advancing agriculture as well. <clears throat> The uh, role of Metropolitan is to import water supplies to our 26 member agencies on the coastal plain of Southern California, which has about 19 million people <laughs> living there, about half the state's population. Uh, we couldn't do this successfully if we didn't partner with agriculture. We have partnerships on the Colorado River that allows us to provide funding to growers in exchange for water when we have uh, periods of drought. Uh, it's been very successful. <clears throat> we think it's been a benefit to agriculture. We have partnerships in the Central Valley to manage or, or be a part of management of groundwater basins so that we can put supplies in there when they're available and then pull them out uh, during times when our supplies are not available. We also work with uh, growers in the Sacramento Valley, also in Yolo Bypass. We've been involved with uh, fish over rice projects that that create good food supply for fish, doesn't interfere with, with rice farming. And I think uh, some of you know that um, we have made a commitment over the years to invest in projects that aren't in our service area to provide operational benefits and benefits to the environment that um, I think says a lot about Metropolitan and is part of who I want our organization to be. And we plan to continue to do that into the future. Um, urban and ag, agencies and entities are not separate when it comes to California water. Uh, we share common challenges and through partnerships is really the only way for us to both succeed. California Water Fix is definitely a partnership. We're trying to modernize the systems 
of the Central Valley Project and the State Water Project, two different projects built in different decades by different governments. Uh, for many years, we've jointly faced the challenge of a reliable su a water supply, uh, diverting water um, <clears throat> that has been impacted by um, endangered fish uh, close to the, the intakes. It's decreased our supply and our reliability. For the last 11 years, we've been involved in a, a joint planning process that has led to the project known as, as Cal Water Fix. And now we're in the process of determining <clears throat> the level of investment interest in that project. As many of you probably know, my board last month voted to pursue an investment in Cal Water Fix proportional to our traditional share of diversions from the two projects, which is close to 26%. It was a 69% vote in favor, which, which I think uh, <clears throat> sends a great message. I want to give you a little bit of a background on how this fits into Southern California's overall long-term water strategy. About 30%, as Jay showed, of Southern California's water supply comes from the Delta. I, I would add that that represents about 4% of the water that annually or a on an average flows through the Delta. So about 4% of that water for half the state's population. Another 25% of our water supply comes from the Colorado River. Uh, Metropolitan built an aqueduct uh, 80 years ago, and that's an important supply to us as well. The other 45% comes from local projects, which includes uh, the LA City Aqueduct, which uh, diverts water from the Owens Valley. Uh, we've lowered demand in Southern California by a million acre feet uh, through investments such as turf removal and plumbing retrofits, uh, low flow toilets. We're proud of this accomplishment. We're looking to increase our conservation by another half million acre feet between now and 2040. And we're not slowing down on conservation at all. And in spite of record rainfalls, our message was keep conserving. We need to put as much water into storage as we can because the next drought is always right around the corner. We're not looking for more supplies from Northern California. I want to emphasize that. We want to get what we used to get. We want it to be more reliable. And we believe that investments in infrastructure that protect the environment will lead to a more reliable water supply. My home agency is Eastern Municipal Water District in Western Riverside County. We have four water reclamation plants. We recycle all of our water um, and we provide about 30,000 acre feet to agriculture, which is a big deal for, for us down there. I'm not sure ag would uh, survive without it. Um, but we can't do this without a good a quality water supply, which is what we get from Northern California. The Colorado River water is, is great, but the salt is, is definitely higher, and um, by nature, the recycling process adds salt to that water. So when you start with a, a higher um, content of salt, it's, it's a challenge to make that work uh, for crops like avocados and, and different uh, crops like that that we have in our service area. We need the ability to capture high flows in wet winters, uh, such as the one we just had last year. Um, our member agencies rely on metropolitan in the dry years. And for these reasons, the vast majority of the board, as I said, supported Cal Water Fix as a sound investment as part of our overall water strategy. And we took this work uh, action after a number of workshops, a lot of public input, um, and it was a historic decision for Metropolitan. And we want to continue our partnership with agriculture and modernizing the Delta projects that are so important for our mutual survival. Metropolitan is working closely with state and federal administrations to identify the appropriate next step. As my general manager has stated, we could proceed with a project as currently proposed, a smaller project if the available funding is smaller or no project at all. Um, we continue to think that the Twin Tunnel project as originally proposed is the best path forward. I, I feel like one tunnel is strictly urban because it's not half the cost. It's way more than half the cost. And, and I think the big uh, challenge for ag now is how do we pay for these improvements of the Twin Tunnels that allows us to have that reliable water supply? Um, Westlands took their vote, and, and uh, I agreed with 
with what they did because based on what they were presented, it just didn't make sense. Um, if you put Sigma with that, as also Jay pointed out, there's real challenges for agriculture when it comes to water supply. Um, <clears throat> I will say that my conversations with growers in the Central Valley, no one has said we don't really uh, care about a less reliable water supply. That could, couldn't be farther from the truth. The, the, the reliability is, is a big deal. And we continue to work together toward a solution. I'm hoping for a successful outcome of this process to uh, line up the funding necessary uh, to make it happen. Uh, Carla earlier today mentioned that there's discussions going on about an agency like Metropolitan picking up someone else's um, <clears throat> supply. That will have to go back to our board. We've been very clear about that. Um, so uh, a lot of us on the board think it makes sense to fund as much of the supply for these uh, or, or the investment for this for these improvements as possible and a perspective that that I'm, I might leave you with is that uh, we do all kinds of projects in Southern California one of our member agencies built ocean D cell uh, which is very reliable and and they know it's expensive but they wanted that reliability our numbers show that if Metropolitan were to take on this entire project on their own that it would still be cheaper than ocean D cell so it's just a perspective for you to uh, to keep in mind. So again, thank you for letting me be here. I'm a little concerned that Ben Drake asked me to come and then he doesn't show up, <laughs> but uh, we'll, we'll figure that out later. Thank you. Randy, thank you so much. We appreciate it. We'll do questions um, after we hear from Jason. Thank you. As Josh pointed out, uh, Jason Phillips, CEO of Friant Water Authority, and he also uh, gave away a secret that I was 15 years at the Bureau of Reclamation, uh, which uh, today I'm representing the Front Water Authority, but in the 15 years I was with the Bureau, I took on a number of uh, different assignments, and I won't go through them all, but uh, a couple of notable ones. I was the uh, first program manager for the San Joaquin River Restoration Settlement uh, to implement that between NRDC and Front Water Authority. Uh, and also was the area manager of the Klamath project, and then finished my last uh, few years as the deputy regional director in Sacramento. And during that time, okay. And during that time, uh, the last year I was the uh, point person for Interior, working on the Cal Water Fix biological opinion. So uh, I got out of there before. Uh, before that was finished up but <clears throat> so but I want to talk real quickly about Friant uh, divisions interest in the water fix because it's not that straightforward and, and then also I think it will kind of highlight some of the challenges for federal contractors in general uh, and why the Central Valley project is having problems getting to that uh, opting in for the make it the 9,000 CFS but first um, <clears throat> to really get a sense of Friant, we're dealing with the same issues, a big, big issue that the whole San Joaquin Valley is facing right now. And uh, so I want to start just by highlighting where Friant is in the San Joaquin Valley and how we get our water. So uh, this is a map that shows the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, I think everyone should be able to figure out where you are there in California. I know when they have these, as these maps come flying by, sometimes it's hard to figure out where it really is. So I'm going to show you. Here's the San Joaquin Valley, and it's really the San Joaquin Valley is broken up. The northern part of it is the San Joaquin River uh, region, and the bottom half is the Tulare Lake region. And then the bigger circle there is the, um, or the, the red part, actually, not the bigger one. The red part is the valley floor where all the farming. Uh, takes place. So I'm going to zoom in on that just a little bit. And what I'm going to do is superimpose on this map uh, where the Friant division is. It's right there. So uh, the Friant division uh, takes water from Millerton Lake, just north of Fresno. And there's canals that go 30 miles to the north and 150 miles to the south. So it's about 185 miles of canal from Chowchilla to the north to uh, south of Bakersfield uh, on the east side. And even though maybe the, a more severe problem on the west side, we are 
uh, dealing with some very, very significant issues on the east side of the San Joaquin Valley as well that I'll get into very quickly because it really starts to highlight why we're interested in the water fix. Um, and to understand, to, to better understand our, our interest, you have to understand a couple things about Friant. Um, so Friant has 31, the, that map that I showed you, the green of the Friant division, there's 31 water contractors uh, in five counties. Uh, that's over 1.2 million acres of land. And I'm just going <clears> to, <throat> so this map here was, so it's California tilted counterclockwise 45 degrees so that it's, um, so that that's the, that's the viewpoint that makes it easier to, to highlight here. So that's what we've done. That's the San Joaquin Valley. And right in the uh, middle here, the blue dot, you'll see Friant Dam. And then flowing directly west is the San Joaquin River. And then it makes a bend around Los Banos and heads straight north to the Delta. Um, and to understand Fry, you got to understand how um, the exchange contract works, which I'll just one, one minute overview. Bef in the 1930s, the United States entered into a contract with what's called the exchange contractors. And the exchange contractors were historic riparian um, river water users around Los Banos, about 400,000 acres of land roughly. And it was determined at the time that if, they, if the United States wants to build Friant, they've got to settle with those uh, riparian land owners. And the settlement is that the United States constructed Shasta Reservoir and Delta Mendota uh, Canal with the Tracy Pumping Plant, now Jones Pumping Plant, and deliver an average of about 840,000 acre feet of water from the Delta to uh, the exchange contractors. And in exchange for that, the United States, through reclamation, built Friant Dam and then entered into contracts with the 31 contractors that uh, make up the Friant Division. And for the most part, all of the water was spoken for. On an average year, it's completely spoken for. There's no flows down the San Joaquin River until the restoration settlement, which uh, was an agreement to, to put, on average, about 230,000 acre feet of water down the San Joaquin River. So as long as everything is working well, the highest priority deliveries out of the Delta go to the exchange contractors, and um, all of the yield out of Friant Dam goes to the Friant contractors. If the Bureau cannot meet its requirements under the contract, then there's provisions in which water from Friant has to be released down to the exchange contractors. So we have this weird relationship with Delta uh, deliveries for 70 years uh, after the, the contracts were signed. It was never shorted. The exchange contractors always got their full supply from the Delta. In 2014 and 2015, they did not, and uh, all of the water that was available in, in Friant had to be released, and the Friant division for the first time ever had a zero water supply. Um, and so that, and that, the, the way in which the contract was operated is under litigation because the Bureau didn't do it right. But um, that said, we do agree that, yeah, there was a shortage, there should have been some releases, and uh, now we have a lot greater interest in uh, the Delta than we did before. <clears throat> and those are some of the facilities I just talked about. On average, there's about 1.2 million acre feet of yield available out of Millerton. Uh, and now that's not all deliveries, it's because some of that goes down the river. All right, so why did we build Friant? Why did they go through, why did they build Shasta Reservoir, all this stuff just to bring on the Friant Division mostly? Well, um, groundwater overdraft is not, is not just a contemporary problem. Back in uh, this, so I've just got a couple charts with irrigation districts. This is Arvin Edison, one of our uh, bigger uh, districts. This is a chart, the red line shows the groundwater average depth from the surface to groundwater from 1935 to 1965, dropped almost 200 feet, pretty much just straight. So there was, there was a lot of um, anxiety about this is not good and if we wanna sustain agriculture, we need to recharge the groundwater table. The blue bars is when, for this district, when Friant delivery started uh, coming on and you can see what happens to the red line. Now in wetter years, they're able to recharge 
In drier years, they use groundwater. Overall, things have been pretty balanced. Uh, and I just have one other district, Delano Early Mart, also in the South Valley of the San Joaquin. Same thing from 1920 to 1950, just a nosedive, that was the average depth of groundwater. The blue line is the deliveries, acre feet per acre, uh, from Millerton that started just after uh, 1950. And they average about two acre feet per acre of surface water. And with that, you can see the groundwater table in their district has recovered quite well. Uh, so that was why the Friant Division came on, was to have a sustainable uh, agricultural community there that was not overdrafting groundwater. And for the most part, for 70 years, it's been very successful. Uh, but let's be honest here. The, the, when you talk about Sigma and the issues facing agriculture in, in uh, the state, um, it's, a, it's a San Joaquin Valley, is, is, that's ground zero. And the orange there is a map showing, again, the, the black outline is the San Joaquin Valley. The orange is the, is the critically overdrafted area. I've kind of circled the east side of the San Joaquin there. That's the Friant Division. Um, the, the situation right now is no longer stable. Uh, it's a major problem. And critically overdrafted. And so this is, I, I stole this from a PPIC report. I thought it was a good report in March that sort of highlights the issues in the San Joaquin Valley. And this is just a water balance. And, and I'm not going to talk about all this, but just I want to highlight some of the critical um, aspects of this. This is a mass balance. So it's water coming in, water going out of San Joaquin Valley. To just simplify it, they've identified groundwater overdraft close to 2 million acre feet per year. That's probably about right using these other assumptions. So what are the options? How do I mean you can't have 2 million acre feet per year? Okay. Well, the first thing you'd look at is, well, how much is leaving the valley? Let's try and capture some more of that. Well, there's about 3.5 million acre feet a year. It's very, very, very tightly managed. Okay. It's all regulatory requirements that, if anything, uh, is going up, right? That's the discussion with the state board and the tributary of San Joaquin River. So, you know, just from a big picture, I think about, go, wait a second. So we're two million acre feet overdrafted and we're having a discussion about massively increasing outflows. All right. Um, the other thing I want to point out is that number right there. Delta imports in this an analysis was 4.9 million acre feet. I don't think that's a very good long-term number. That's about what we expect today is what's happening in the Delta. The projections in the water fix is that that goes down by more than a million acre feet a year because of increased regulation um, and climate change. So if you add that million acre feet, now you're at three million acre feet plus pressure to, to send more water out uh, through the Delta. So what are the solutions? You, your outflow is tightly managed. You have nothing uh, to grab for outflow, except for an extreme flood years. The only uh, tributary that really has water to capture in big flood years right now is the San Joaquin River. And so that's that discussion about temperance flat. If you're about temperance flat reservoir, the Bay Area hates it. Uh, it's like, don't talk about temperance flat. That's fine, it's expensive. Even if you built Temperance Flat for $3 billion, you capture about 120,000 acre feet a year. Okay, great. Um, so we're at 2 million acre feet overdraft, probably really 3 million acre feet. Uh, the only flood water that you have to capture that's leaving the system that's being discussed is with Temperance, and that's objected by, I'm sure, more than half the state. and wouldn't even solve a big chunk of the problem. Um, the water fix estimated that 4.9 million acre feet a year of exports would be the average annual exports with the tunnels. It doesn't bring this number up, it keeps it the same. And uh, so when we talk about reliability, nobody's talking about trying to get more water. We have, you know, 
contracts that in some cases are 40, 50 years old for a certain amount of water that at the time was, that's your reliable supply. Well, now that's been reduced by about 3 million acre feet. So we're trying to figure out a way to bring some of that back because you know the only way you can start to balance this overdraft is then reducing the net water use. The only way you can reduce net water use and not contribute to overdraft is retirement. So we are uh, very interested in increasing reliability through our source that, that brought the region into sustainability in the first place, which was the Delta. Uh, we're interested in more surface storage and more conveyance um, to the extent that it can be, I think it's fine. I mean, I think the irrigator should pay for it uh, if they want to have new storage. That's fine. But we're not going to come up with 3 million acre feet. So uh, it, it's very interesting to us to, to come up with any possible solution because come up with 3 million acre feet per year of water supply conservation through retirement. Just picture a million to a million and a half acres of farmland leaving. Uh, that's probably not what I don't, I don't think this board wants to see that. We certainly don't want to see it. Um, I just counterclockwise to California, 45 degrees again. This is how Friant can get water from the Delta. Um, here's my last slide. So the California Aqueduct runs all the way right through the west side, mainly of the San Joaquin Valley. But we have uh, multiple ways within the Friant Division to enter into deals uh, with people who can take water off the California Aqueduct. We, can, we have contractors that take it right into this Cross Valley Canal up into our system. Um, we have water users who use water from the Kings River uh, who could do an exchange deal with other people that also have Kings Water and California Aqua. So there's a lot of creative exchanges that can take place in terms of getting additional water straight to Fryant in addition to helping increase the reliability of the exchange contract. Uh, so that is kind of the, the Fryant's interest. And I've got other thoughts on just the broader CVP and why that is flailing right now, but that's really not part of my presentation. And so I'll answer those questions if they come. So thank you. Perfect, Jason. Thank you. That was. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I mean that uh, that chart is not a happy uh, place to be. Um, questions from the board. Andy. Ocean desal is uh, still much more expensive than than the uh, than the tunnels. What kind of? I mean, just a kind of a gross cost comparison are we looking at today and in the future? <clears throat> our uh, supply to our member agencies is a little over a thousand dollars an acre foot now, and uh, desal is twenty three, twenty four hundred dollars an acre foot. So we originally, when we looked at the tunnels, we were projecting about a $5 per household increase in, in your monthly water payment. We now think it's closer to $3. So if you multiply that by four, since we're a quarter of the two projects, $12 a month, that's not, um, it doesn't approach desal. And I'm not being critical of desal. It's reliable and it is, it is expensive. But when you have areas that are heavily populated and they have high tech and and important uh, safety infrastructure. It's, it's important to have that mix of a lot of different supplies. I have uh, Bryce Lumberg, Eric, and then Nancy. Thank you all for your presentation. It's all very, very, very interesting. Um, uh, my question, uh, first a comment in relationship to Metropolitan Water District. Um, I thank you for your leadership, your vision, your action and your um, impact. I think, um, um, and, and the tours that you do, um, 
both bringing people up here to Northern California from your districts and folks from Northern California to Southern California. I think that exchange is, um, is ama amazing and, and very, very, very important. Um, the um, question I have for you, Randy, and uh, is maybe related to the question I asked um, uh, Carla earlier, just as far as the um, the um, opportunity to, to clear opposition or protests from senior water rights holders here in, in Northern California. I think the water rights holders here in Northern California would like to, um, to well, would like not to oppose or protest the, the project. It's a critical component for liability for Central California, Southern California. But I, I think we would like to see a, um, a, um, an operating uh, manual or a operating procedure that that takes into consideration the uh, ability of the facility to potentially do harm where it's not intended. Um, the other question I would ask, and, and anyone maybe could comment, how do you link the um, the Cal Water Fix project to the State Water Resources Control Board water quality proceeding? Do you see a situation where the proceeding that the State Water Board does is so has such a large impact on water supply that the um, that the water fix doesn't have enough water to move. <clears throat> Let me uh, try to answer your first question. We've had this discussion on and off for a while, and certainly don't want to impact anybody else's water supply. I mean, I tell people that I don't want the water you need. I want the water that you couldn't possibly use, and that's why you need big infrastructure so that you can take water when it's plentiful. It's hard for us when we um, see that 4% of the Delta supply is what we need, that we think that's reliable for our needs. It's really difficult for us to then backstop other areas of the state. Um, you know, I, I can't emphasize enough that we want the reliability and we don't want excess or, or more water. Um, we continue to invest in projects all over the state, uh, sites reservoir and a not a huge way, but we want to be part of that process. So um, I, I, I mean, I can't tell you that I can relieve all your concerns about what could happen in the future. That's impossible. But um, I want you to feel like based on actions that we've take over the, taken over the last couple of decades and investments in, in the Sacramento Valley that we're committed to, a, to the whole state and to a good process. I have a lot of concerns about the state board, and uh, I'll just leave that part of the question for the experts. <laughs> All right. Eric. <laughs> Jason, uh, so I'm looking at your chart. Very helpful. Um, and so the numbers are based on averages, correct? Um, <laughs> okay, thanks, sir. All right, so both of you. So, and, and um, I'm just trying to, it, it is a sort of a depressing chart uh, in the way you pose it. So I'm just trying to poke holes in it, not to be provocative, but just to, to make sure everything's in here. Um, in wet years, and there's a meeting tomorrow to talk about groundwater recharge, but it, it, I mean, is it just a drop in the bucket, or is there, I mean, can you get into the millions if you have, if you have um, a really successful groundwater recharge effort? So in wet years, which is built into the averages, um, I would use, I would just look back at temperance flat, the analysis that shows, and that's the major, that's the major, you know, stream on the east side of the valley that is probably has, is undersized storage. Because uh, you look at you look at others that are you know most of the reservoirs are are one million acre feet or greater, and Millerton has really about three hundred and eighty five thousand acre feet of operable storage, with a one point eight million acre foot average inflow, so it's undersized. But even if you build Temperance, will be another one point two million acre feet of storage. Your annual average yield from that is going to be about 120,000 acre feet. 
That's surface though, right? So I'm just, there is no arrow here for groundwater recharge. Is that because it's effectively zero or because? Okay, so, so sorry. It's okay. I think it's yeah. um, I made the chart, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's the mass balance of all the water that flows into the valley and flows out of the valley. And so the water within the valley, between surface water and groundwater, once it's in, we're not counting it. Counting that. it, it that's just what okay. there is. We so have I'm, the overdraft of, you just took, took water out of the groundwater and didn't put it back. Okay. Um, my recollection of the numbers is, you know, in addition to temperance flat, there's a lot of talking about, let's take uh, flood water in wet years and, and, and send it out onto the fields and try to infiltrate additional groundwater. Uh, there's a lot of different talk about different ways you could improve that mass balance a little bit by capturing wet year water that's flowing out the San Joaquin for the most part. Um, but I don't think anybody in any of, the, any of the numbers that I've seen get that number beyond about two, maybe 300,000 acre feet per year on average. You, know, you might get 500 or a million acre feet or so in, in some of the extreme wet years, but we don't have enough of those. No. We've got a lot more dry years than, than really wet years. So part B of this question, it's just trying to fill out the chart again, because Jason, you made the comment that the only way to address, if this situation stays the same, the only way to address groundwater overdraft is to take land out of production. Um, so part B is what about water conservation? What about efficiency and irrigation and things like that? Is there, or have we squeezed out all the efficiency that can be gained? So the, the good thing about looking at it in the way that this, this diagram does is that if you, uh, and it's why I highlighted how important it is that what leaves the system is very uh, tightly managed and you're not going to change that. So if you could conserve water, let's say we came up with a way to conserve through recycling um, and other conservation uh, 500,000 acre feet per year on average. The problem with that is then the San Joaquin River outflow, if everything else stayed the same, would go to uh, 3 million acre feet a year and you would no longer be meeting your regulatory requirements so you have to just send that water out the river. And so that's why I made that point. If there was a lot of excess water leaving the system, uh, you could capture that by means such as recycling, new storage, uh, diverting into groundwater recharge. But you can't do that here because every, every drop of water that goes through is already spoken for and managed. So if you reduce your water use through recycling reduces the San Joaquin River flow. You just have to release that out of storage then, which has the same problem. Uh, also, if you, if you conserve on field and just use less water for crops, the crop is still taking the same amount of water. So now you've just reduced recharge. Uh, so it's just a mass balance. Well, I can just, I'm not going to ask another question, but just a, a comment. Um, and it relates to the San Joaquin River outflow, which is a pretty big chunk of water. And when when I didn't track this issue closely when it was happening, I was out of state for most of the time um, that it was being settled. Uh, you know, I thought it was in, for those of you not familiar, I have one of the environmental seats on the board, right? So um, it was kind of an inspirational story to put water back in the river and, and whatnot. But, um, there's an argument that the habitat values that were uh, hoped for with water being put back in the river are not being recognized, in part because, you know, water in a canal doesn't necessarily result in habitat. You've got to do something. You gotta, there's other elements that have not yet happened. So anyway, can of worms for today, but maybe for future, future <laughs> conversation, should be look at that three and a half million acre feet and see what kind of habitat values we're getting from it. And, you know, maybe there's a combination of some additional kind of stream side habitat or other f features in the river that could deliver the habitat values that we're seeking for the San Joaquin River at a, you know, lower water volume. I don't know. I'm not an expert, but. Big picture thinking, Eric. For sure. I mean, I have uh, Nancy, Ashley, and then Helene. 
Uh, Professor Lund, could you spend just a few more minutes on the Delta Sigma Challenge chart? Um, yeah. So this is an attempt to take that mass balance picture that, that we did with PPIC that, that Jason talked about um, and to, to take it apart a little bit. So we took um, the um, CVGSM um, models and C2VSIM models that the federal and state government do for groundwater balances in the southern part of the Central Valley. And they've got 82 years, essentially, of, of what would happen today with that mass balance. And so you've got wet years and dry years. And so in terms, you can take the average of that and estimate, here's how, how you, you would balance with sigma. You know, how much either additional water supply would you have to recharge or reduction in pumping would you have to have, reduction in water use would you have to have to bring you into balance. But that average is not 100% certain because it just reflects what we happen to see the last 82 years and some calculations. Looking forward, where they have to assess whether they're compliant with sigma, you might get have a lot of wet years, and you might get unlucky and have your mic die. <laughs> um, and if, if you get lucky, it's going to look like you, you complied, and then, then you won't be later on. You'll have misled people. And if you get unlucky, you're, you might end up having to conserve a whole lot more just to come back into compliance. So uh, we did some little statistics on that, and, and we're doing some more studies on this with PPIC again um, that I think will be a little frightening, as this diagram is to me. But you see it varies quite a lot between different parts of the valley. Uh, so I had two questions. One is a follow-up to one of the ones that Eric asked, and you may have answered this, but maybe maybe I'm coming at it in a little bit different way, and you can help me understand. So, um, given the expense of um, temperance and the yield it gets, is there an argument for instead investing that to achieve more groundwater storage with those waters that you would theoretically store, and put that in the ground instead? So y yes. There is a good argument for that, and, and uh, I, I think the, the probability of any federal or state dollars going to temperance flat for the benefit of recharge in agriculture areas is next to zero. So because of that, it really puts the burden on the farmers themselves to figure out what is going to be the best investment. And uh, so we're... We support continuing to look at temperance, but we're not at a point where we say, yes, it's where we want to put our money. Uh, I, am, I am making the argument that because of this mass balance chart, we should not encourage public financing of, of temperance flat because to the extent that public financing occurs, like say through Prop 1, it's for purposes that might not help groundwater recharge because groundwater recharge is not considered a public purpose. And so we need to look at it to solve this problem. It's a massive problem. And the other thing I would point out is what we are 100% behind is improving our conveyance systems that we have in order to get water when it is available to recharge. And it's one reason why uh, there will be a, a proposition on the ballot in 2018, and that's why the Friant money is in there. Is, um, this overdraft is, is causing the, the, the ground to sink. Our canal has sunk by two feet in a one-year time frame from 2015 to 16. And we just got survey results back a few weeks ago that said in the past five months, it's sunk another five inches. And so because of that, when water is available, we probably lost two to 300,000 acre feet of water this year that was available in Millerton, but our canal was full because it didn't have capacity. So. Um, I know there's been some criticism from the environmental community on Friant trying to get money in, a, in the bond that it might help temperance or something, but it, it really is, uh, it's going to be a, a systemic problem. The California aqueduct is also subsiding. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to hit others as well. Uh, my second question is 
uh, to you and PPIC, and I, I think you might have penned the, the op-ed, came out with a recommendation for one tunnel. And I wonder if you could just briefly highlight the reasons for that. And also, I'm a little confused. I've heard different uh, statements about the benefit to the in-delta habitat from one tunnel versus two tunnels. And I think it was Lester Snow at the PPIC conference last week that said that the, a smaller tunnel wouldn't deliver the benefits that uh, a larger one would for the delta, which was a little counterintuitive for me to understand. So if you could just elaborate on that. Let me start with that part. Um, if you read the article in the front page of the Sacramento Bee this morning, um, if you go further to the inside, there's a quote from Peter Moyle, who's, who's the fish god. Um, about um, about the tunnels, and, and his his thought was that if you uh, have the smaller tunnel capacity, that you will not have you will not have enough water being diverted through the tunnels. And if you sustain the the levels of agricultural flow uh, exports without tunnels, then you have too much reverse flow in the southern parts, in the channels in the southern and central parts of the delta. And that's what he sees as being one of the primary problems for fish in the delta. So he's actually in favor of, of larger capacities for delta exports through the tunnels. Right. I, I, you know, there's a lot you can say for and against any of these options. No tunnels, one tunnel, two tunnels. Um, I think at this time, maybe the most important thing that you might say about one tunnel is you'll be easier to get enough agreement to fund it. That it, Most of the stuff that I see on it now is more about getting enough people to partner into it, and, and, and particularly on the federal side, um, with some of their um, his, history on the contracts. One of the other problems uh, that comes up with one tunnel is it's very good for the urban areas. It'll, it'll, it'll provide them with very full supplies, but it won't provide very much for agriculture. And so it really does set up more of this antagonism between agriculture in the southern part of the Central Valley and the environment, but there'll be enough capacity so that the maybe some of the urban areas will decide they, they don't even have to be, participate in a lot of the Delta problems. That's, I think, a strategic issue that people might want to think about. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Yeah. Um, a while back, I think this committee heard from some folks in San Diego, was it, that were doing some desal? And they admitted it was expensive, but they felt like it was working for them. And if you go to Australia, you'll hear people talk about it successfully working for them, and the Israelis seem to be making it work for them. I'm just curious, is it the cost of uh, compensation and salaries that makes it too expensive for us? Because the equipment's got to be about the same. I think it's just energy. It's You have to force the water through these membranes. It takes a lot of uh, pressure to do that. Um, agriculture in the med service area at $1,000 an acre foot, there's not many crops that can survive on that price of water. So when you double that, that's impossible. Uh, and as I said, that's the desal in San Diego County is part of a mix of what they're doing. And, and so a certain amount of that is really important because they have some really high end needs that they need to be able to uh, satisfy in the worst conditions. I mean, we haven't had that huge natural disaster in California that we keep thinking could happen. And when it does, to have that kind of a supply, even at that cost, will be very valuable. And if you look at Santa Barbara, where they have desal and and it goes on and off because whenever there's a, a cheaper supply, it makes a lot more sense. So it's, it's, part, of the, it's part of the full package of having a reliable water supply, but there's very little other than urban and, and some municipal uses that can survive on that. Just for international perspective, 
during their millennial drought, the Australians built about five or six desal plants. Um, all but one of them is mothballed. That's a huge sunk cost that they're still having to pay off. The only one that's still open is the one in Perth, where they really never came out of that drought. So they, they essentially experienced a, a permanent climate change, what appears to be a more permanent change in climate that, that led them to keep that plant open. But it's many billions of dollars of sunk costs that they're paying off now. Israel has a, uh, makes a lot of use of uh, seawater desalination for their water supply system. Um, and basically it's for an urban water supply and a lot of their agriculture is supplied by the wastewater from the urban areas. So um, again, it doesn't go directly to um, agriculture, but it, it indirectly serves. And because it's such a small country, you can make that work. Whereas here, we have a hard time getting it from Hyperion over the mountains back to the uh, Central Valley. I, I had a question, Randy, about uh, sort of water literacy in your service area. So just sort of average folk, and maybe you've done polling on this in L.A. and some of the other urban areas. Do people know where, you know, the sort of rough breakdown of where water is coming from? Does, do they, like, what what's the level of uh, understanding of Delta issues, and how does that influence your sort of policy making at, at the, on the MET board? I'm not sure that we've done polling on where the water comes from. I do think that there's a better understanding that it's imported based on the drought and what we saw uh, at our request and the governor's request for conservation was was really phenomenal and people stepped up and did it. Of course, we invested $400 million in turf removal. And we hopefully that changes the culture going forward. Uh, but, you know, it, it's it's fascinating for the most part. Nobody ever turns a tap on and nothing comes out. Nobody goes to the store to buy food and there's not just anything you want at a reasonable price. Last year, the county of L.A. passed a transportation bond of $120 billion. <laughs> it's over 50 years, but still, everybody sits in traffic. And, and so... <laughs> That, you know, that's tangible. You can see it. So um, I want people to have a reliable water supply. I don't care to get credit for it. But on the other hand, it, sometimes you don't realize how fragile that supply can be. So I, I'm not sure they know where it comes. But I do know that because of the drought, it's uh, the value of the water, I think, is, is seen uh, better today in Southern California. And our last question of the day, Mr. Bryce Lindberg. I believe it's critical that this project be uh, completed during the Brown administration. Uh, and Governor Brown has, an, has a vision for this project, his support for this project. Uh, do, you, do you see that similarly, and do you see a timeline uh, where it's done during, uh, or the permitting and, and approval process is done during the Brown administration, or do you... Uh, see it um, moving into an, a new administration and, and what the um, impact of, of that might be. I agree with you completely on the first two points. I think it's critical to get it done, and I think it's critical that it happens while Governor Brown is in office. And I don't know. I don't know what happens um, if we can't get the funding commitments. I mean, I hear other talks about some, you know, commercial banks getting involved, right? It, it all takes time. I mean, the permitting process took over 10 years, so um, we're pushing as hard as we can. Any other financial commitments that the MET board picks up will have to go back to the board, and that's can be kind of a slow process too. So, I mean, we've got, what, 13 months, and and we're done. So it's, uh, it's going to talk about interesting times that we're living in now. Well, Jay, Randy, Jason, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it and great presentation. Thank you. Um, we do have a one matter of business before the board. Um, you have some draft 2018 meeting dates in your packets. Um, by statute, the board is um, to meet monthly. 
So um, the challenge with the January meeting in terms of our normal schedule, we would be looking at um, the third, well, no, sorry. We'd be looking at the second <laughs> would be our meeting date. So um, given that, I am proposing either that we cancel the January meeting or we combine a January, February meeting and do a two-day meeting. January 31st, which would be a Wednesday, and February 1st, which would be a Thursday. Or we could cancel the January meeting and make our first meeting the Tuesday, February 6th. And then um, July 10th, um, um, our, it, the 4th of July is in the middle of the week. Um, Tuesday would be the third. And so in terms of getting speakers and quorum for the board, I'm just concerned about that. So I don't know if we want to amend our meeting date for that time frame as well. So those are my recommendations. Um, no, typically what we'll do is the plan is that we'll do our December meeting as our planning meeting. We'll have a couple of hours. Okay. We'll do planning. Um, I had initial thoughts, and I will circulate with um, the chair or with the board at that time on December as well. We could maybe do a visit to uh, the wine country to kind of see kind of see some of the impact to the area and do some other events around for that two-day meeting. Josh, what the um, – sorry, Bryce. I was just going to ask, so – by statute, we're required to meet once a month, but you're asking us if we want to cancel one of the tw well, 12 Well, it's, not, it's uh, not that we haven't. I mean, yeah. so I know that we've – the challenge has been that in terms of quorum. I mean, I think that's the significant challenge that we have. So, so can I just ask um, – I don't know what the original rationale was for meeting once a month. I'm sure it was a good one. Um, has anybody ever examined the possibility of amending the statute to make it like t eight, 10 times a year? Your choice, or you know, eight times a year, or something like that. I mean, um, I think it's always dangerous to look at code, but yeah, you can definitely yeah. do that if you like. <laughs> no, I mean, I think, I mean, I think the board is effective on. A, I mean, I think it gives us an opportunity to respond to. Um, um, issues as they arise yep. meeting monthly and I think that's a benefit to the industry I mean I think we've had groundwater issues we've had other issues that the board's been able to weigh in on because of the timing of our meetings and I think that's been a positive Well, those are those are some of our best meetings. Yeah. So thoughts? We normally, um, you know, go to various regions. I mean, two or three times a year. Or, I mean, what's so? The, yeah, typically. I mean, it's usually about once or twice a year. We'll have offsite for the board. So, yeah, I happen to know a campus down in the Central Coast. <laughs> we'd love to, we'd love to host you all. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. I propose um, doing two two-day meetings. You know, another one maybe the second half of the year. <laughs> Josh is wincing, but and that way we have ten total meetings. Two of them are kind of like site visits that are someplace interesting. Well, I no, I think I think it would be uh would be fantastic. I just want to caution that with any luck, that is our rainy season. So I just want to say that, you know, for tramping around and seeing outdoor destruction, hopefully it will be impossible.
So do we have kind of consensus on that first two dates, uh, January 31st, February 1st? I mean, and we'll definitely try to target yep. wine country, but if not, we can pivot to something else. Um, Eric, I do like your idea. I just don't know what other date that would be good in terms of messing with to um, combine for a two-day. I, I just took a look at uh, May, June. There's a May 31 and June 1. That would be a Wednesday and a Thursday. It'll be a Thursday, Friday. May oh. 31st is Thursday, right? Wednesday. I looking at the wrong month. Yeah, it worked the wrong year. Oh, how about 2018? Great, thanks, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, Scratch that. <laughs> so are you guys comfortable on the July? 31 months. I'm just worried that, I mean, yeah. that's always been, the summer months has always been hard for us, and that's. Look at that one, just look at the first to the end of the month. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're not doing that. We could do um, July 31st, August 1st. Do you want to do that? July How does July yeah. 31st, which is a Tuesday? A Wednesday. August 1st, which is a Wednesday. Yeah. So that gives us two two-day meetings. And about halfway through the year, so that's good. So what do you start on? So, and you know, we are basically at a full board complement, so quorum is, you know, harder to achieve sometimes, so attendance is definitely right. important okay. as well. Majority? Eight, two? Eight, two, majority. We're probably not going to meet at UC Davis that day. Yeah, we'll meet at UC Davis that day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Is that acceptable to everyone? So yep. January 31st, February 1st, two-day meeting. Everything's the same. We are no longer doing July 10th. It'll be a July 31st, August 1st meeting. Great. And it'll be September 4th, October 2nd, November 6th, and December 4th. Do we need to move that? What was the last two? What was it? Just we have a full board, so quorum is an issue too. All right. I would need a motion. So moved. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Perfect. Um, also within your folders, kind of just housekeeping items, there is a payee data form. The state switched to a new um, financial system. So we cannot process your travel reimbursements unless that form is filled out. So if you like to have travel reimbursements, um, I need that form filled out. <laughs> yes, so um, typically um, we are planning kind of the resolution okay. that would come from the secretary okay. on that standpoint. And so that was what the general thought was. I know we'll be trying to work with the governor's office for something as well in terms of the president. But from the board standpoint, I mean, I'm open for suggestions. Which, which will be his last meeting? Uh, December will be the last meeting. Someone had a good idea. I'd be up for, uh, you know, contributing towards a gift for for Craig from us would be really nice. I just have to think of what the right gift yeah, is. <laughs> we could ask Julie. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I mean, I can definitely. I mean, if someone has ideas that they want to send me, um, and then we can kind of circulate something. That'd be good. I mean, we still have time, so that's not a problem. Could we uh, could we talk to somebody in the legislature too about maybe passing a resolution, a commendation, or some kind, something like that? I don't know if we can do that. Yeah, quickly. Yeah, I'm just worried. Yeah, I don't know about timing on that one. That might be a challenge. I can um, ask Taylor on that. So. Um, Yes, I'll be sending information out about that. There is an informal dinner on Monday, December uh, December 4th, sure. and then our board meeting is on Tuesday the 6th. And then lunch afterwards. You said informal? Because it sounds like the governor and his wife well, have been invited. Well, it's not an official meeting of the state board. Right, okay. 
So that's what you meant. <laughs> but if the governor's there, maybe. Look sharp. Look sharp. <laughs> Where, Ty? Seriously. Yes. Paul Hawken and Dr. The chair is either designated by the governor from existing members or a new member is appointed as president. And that's through the governor's office. In the interim, you have me. Well, a pleasure meeting you. It was a pleasure. Good place. Yeah. Right. Um, our board is scheduled to be at the um, groundwater um, uh, recharge meeting tomorrow. Yes, so uh, Don, Don Cameron, Ashley Bourne, Bryce Lundberg, Nancy Cassidy, Joy Sterling, and Andy Thulin will all be there. And Mike is also scheduled, but I don't know if he, yes, the ground Bryce, water. Bryce, I, I failed to register, is it, and I looked online today, and it's apparently I've missed the deadline. Do you think there's any chance I could well, get, maybe a, we can discuss that. get an invite? <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, meeting is adjourned.